Good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, being here. Um, I want to uh, just start by um, recognizing that today is September 11th. Uh, I know uh, at school when we um, were recognizing uh, the day that some of my students were saying, you know, I, I was alive then, but I was, you know, two days old, or I was, you know, three months old, or whatever it is, and and they thought it was particularly odd that, you know, they had been alive for for this event but didn't remember it, and um, but we had we had a really great conversation about um, about what it meant, and uh, anyway, I think it would be appropriate for us to take uh, just a moment of silence to uh, remember the the victims of the 9/11 attacks and. Um, uh, and their their families. All right, thank you. So there are um, well, before we get into the, um, the consent agenda, uh, in uh, so in reviewing and approving the agenda, there were a few uh, addendums to the agenda. And I want to uh, break these up into a few parts. So um, I would like to uh, consider uh, the approval of purchasing of uh, truck parts as a part of the consent agenda. So that would make it item G, potentially, um, of the consent agenda. Unless someone objects, we can take it up then. Um, do you have, I'm sorry, sorry, do you have a comment or a question? Uh, did I miss we have not yet gotten there. Don't worry, that's next. Um, so, and then with the appointment of a city council representative to the Main Street um, Middle School Committee, I would like to take that up um, after the historic preservation um, appointment. So that would make it item, basically item six and a half. Uh, and then as for the event fees, I'd like to do that um, just after we do uh, uh, item nine, uh, Chapter nine licensing uh, or the license ordinances, and then after that, we'll do um, the appointment of a, a council rep to the Vermont League of Cities and Towns uh, town fair. Uh, so just before um, basically council reports. Uh, all right. So unless there's any objection to that order, or unless there's anything else, um, I'll consider the agenda approved. Okay, no objections, great, so uh, uh, we're gonna move on. So now is the time for general business and appearances. Uh, so this is a time for the public to comment on any item, uh, or any topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. Um, and if you would attempt to keep your, to your comments to about two minutes uh, or less, that would be wonderful. So any comments from the public? It's fine, no worries. Um, my comments, uh, real, real close. Yeah. Okay. And uh, my if comments, you would say your name and okay. where you're Morgan from. Brown, uh, District 3 resident. Um, my comments might take a little longer. I'd like to read the following for the record. Uh, from Ed Paquin, Executive Director of Disability Rights Vermont, regarding uh, Mark Johnson, Memorial Fund. Dear interested groups and individuals, the Disability Rights Vermont Board of Directors today responded to a concerned Montpelier citizen who hoped for a public remembrance of Mark Johnson and for some vehicle for people to make contributions in his honor that might be used to help with relationships between law enforcement and people in emotional or mental health crisis. The Disability Rights Vermont Board took the action of passing the following resolution. Disability Rights Vermont hereby creates the Mark Johnson Memorial Fund to assist in our efforts to improve the response of law enforcement to incidences involving people with disabilities or who are in mental health or emotional crisis. Disability Rights Vermont will use the fund to further our system improvement efforts by working collaboratively with law enforcement and other 
community partners and, when necessary, by investigating reports alleging inappropriate uses of force. Donations may be made to the Mark Johnson Memorial Fund, care of Disability Rights Vermont, 141 Main Street, Suite 7, Montpelier, Vermont, 05602. We appreciate all who work to make Montpelier a welcoming and safe community. And that's from Ed Pickwin. And if I may, something I wrote is a tribute to Mark Johnson. In remembrance, lest there ever be a time somewhere down the road, come tomorrow, our dear neighbor and caring friend, taken from us very tragically one early morning, be too easily dismissed and forgotten. We shall always remember our hearts remain grieved, still filled with deep sorrow over the sudden loss of the good soul, the gentle child we all knew and greatly missed, who to us was Mark Johnson. Rest in peace. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. And Morgan, thank you for your um, energy and, and the memorial fund and um, your tribute to him. We all, we all appreciate it. All right, thank you. Any other um, comments? Again, thank you, Morgan. Uh, I did hear expression at a prior meeting that the council wanted to move with all haste to be as transparent as possible with records related to that. Uh, I think I've asked our city manager to move uh, with rapidity to identify what records are not subject to the criminal invest or the investigative shooting and, and release them promptly to uh, inform and community discussion and transparency and involvement. Uh, distressed lives matter. I said that at the prior shooting and I had hoped to never say it again. Uh, our, my public records response to the police department revealed that there is no policy in place to escalate to Washington County Mental Health when a person who's known to be a client of Washington County Mental Health is engaged for the third time in a month with the police department. That could have saved a life. So I would ask y'all to take immediate action to get such a policy in place with the police department. Uh, I want to register my impatience and objection that Weeks have passed and we still don't have a date set because the way for the homeless task force, uh, the, the way it was delegated to a city staffer who's on vacation or whatever, uh, it, it seems to reek of a lack of a sense of urgency. It's cold out and people are sleeping with, without a place to use the bathrooms at night, et cetera, without a place to charge their phone. The, this is not something to study for next year's consideration. This is something that needs immediate, and I'm even proposing to some of the folks who weren't appointed that we create a strike force and t take care of some of the immediate needs. But it really should be government that's involved in this. I just want to interject, as, as I understand it, there is a I have received meeting. no notice of a date, and I'm on the, on the task force. Yes, you should have received a notice of the date. I have it here. It's. Monday. September 23rd from yes. 4.30 to 6.30. Monday, right? Yeah, Monday the 23rd at 
the yeah. 23rd. I, I didn't see that that was the only time that Will could make it, but uh, I, I never heard a confirmation from staff that that had been set. Anyway, that, I'm glad it's set. Uh, our meters were running again, no notice to the tourists that they didn't have to pay the meters on Labor Day. Uh, I again would ask that we refund everyone who paid by credit card and get set in motion a process to bag the meters on those days with the bags being courtesy of the merchants. The you can't credit the merchants with the holiday, but you can credit the merchants with the bags. So I think that's a good a goodwill and instead of pe people feeling ripped off, they will feel gratitude. Uh, no progress in a month on the lot over here, no progress whatsoever other than the city sidewalks. No action has been done on that lot in a month. And that's unconscionable from a construction management point of view. Uh, my piece, which was an elaboration of my comments at the prior meeting on a list misplaced priorities, uh, an edit, a version ran in the paper. I'm happy to provide an email copy to Bill and let him circulate it to you. Uh, it, it's worth reading more than once. Uh, I want to commend and, uh, the receptivity of our new public works director. We've had a good conversation, hope to have many more. Uh, specifically around a, a, a publicly viewable inventory of all of the things so that it can be, the public can be engaged in prioritizing those. Uh, a municipal Wi-Fi zone would be an immense benefit to the community. Uh, I even suggested that our cameras could automatically upload the pictures of the public works <laughs> or the crap on the sidewalk that needs cleaning. Uh, you need to take further action on the CVPSA. Whatever you did last time, a watered down, like, be nice and work together, was ineffective at getting any effective action out of CVPSA, and the clock is running out and the money's going to run out. Uh, I want to appeal. I'm, Last items. I want to appeal that the my complaint regarding the public nuisance of, of unmaintained building, a hazardous building, was, uh, I think, for political reasons, quashed at the building inspector level. I got the request from, uh, I got the response from Bill that he said, oh, no, we can't open up this can of worms because it'll involve a whole lot of other buildings but you can't have done selective enforcement on the home farm road and then overlook failing foundations and failing in peeling lead paint, et cetera, hazards in the community just because it's a powerful landlord. Uh, our new pop-up is popped in to, uh, our Cool Runnings chicken is now in the uh, inside of Rabble Rousers and I told Rabble Rousers that they stole my name. <laughs> so. Thank you, Stephen. Any other comments from the public? <coughs> okay. Our, all right, so on to the consent agenda. Is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? I move we pass the consent agenda as amended. Second. Uh, further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, great, thank you. Um, so. Uh, we are only five minutes off from the advertised time um, for the first public hearing on uh, some zoning amendments. Um, and so I'm going to officially uh, open the public hearing uh, on this. Uh, and uh, uh, welcome, Mike. Good evening. I'm Mike Miller. I'm the planning director. And um, so I was just going to quickly go over a quick summary of the significant changes. If you, uh, if anyone wants to see what the changes are, they're online in the Zoning Fixes 2019 uh, tab on the main page. And there's a strikeout version. There's a clean version, and some of the additional materials there. If anyone has questions, they can um, email or call my office. And Mike, um, uh, for people who want to, residents who want to review it. The, the document they should be looking at is the one called City Council Hearing Draft? Yes. Yep. Um, 
because most of these that are before you uh, are zoning fixes that were based on typos or some small changes um, or some search replace items, uh, I'll just focus on what may be a couple of the larger, more significant policy changes that are contained in the document. Um, the first being that this hearing will make permanent the two interim changes that were approved in March. So back in March, we approved that slopes over 30% can now be developed with certification from an engineer and a hearing at the DRB. So that was an interim change that would only be effective for two years. So we're going to make that permanent. And the new landscaping and screening rules that were developed to address a number of issues, including the amount of total landscaping, uh, non-conforming landscaping, and some waivers. Um, so there's some additional changes that were made for landscaping. I won't go into the details, but um, so those would be a couple of the more significant changes. During the second round, um, there are probably, I would describe, three policy changes. Uh, the first being that we're removing the requirement for sp uh, stream buffers on the unchannelized portions of the urban center village. So that big a bit of a mouthful, but um, previously when this had been adopted, there was a requirement to have buffers on what was an undefined term of unchannelized portion. So if it was unchannelized, then you should have buffers. If it was channelized, then you don't have to have buffers if you're in the downtown core. Um, the DRB has made determinations over the past year and a half and found most stream segments in the downtown to be channelized. Um, also, being channelized would require natural, naturally vegetated buffers, which would interfere with projects like Confluence Park. So it was felt by the Planning Commission that th that requirement should just be removed. Uh, there was a memo that the Planning Commission has, has provided the Council that is also online if people want to really drill into the details of that, of that change, but mostly it's just a change to remove the requirement for naturally vegetated buffers in the downtown. Um, another change is to remove the requirement that density be calculated on buildable area rather than parcel size. Uh, most communities use parcel size. Uh, staff found that the rules that had been adopted as buildable area were burdensome to applicants and um, we had anticipated that new slope maps, high resolution slope maps would make this easy, but it turns out it, it didn't. Uh, it added a lot of cost to very small and simple projects. Uh, as zoning districts were already based on parcel size anyways, when we did all those calculations for 90%, they were based on parcel size, not on buildable area size. We felt that um, removing the requirement with, would um, not impact the character of the neighborhoods. Again, Planning Commission agreed, and they provided a memo uh, to that effect. Uh, and then the third change was the one you approved at the last meeting, which was the VCFA parcel boundary change, uh, which I don't think I've, I think everyone was here for that one, um, which I don't believe is, um, which I believe would be a, more of a policy change. Uh, I also received a question about the strikeout version on why a word would be deleted or struck out and then put back in. That's just a funky thing if you do search replace. Um, at the last meeting, I think I mentioned that there was a legal decision that came down that made the Oxford comma official, and if you don't have it, then it's read as not having it. So we did a search replace on that. So when it has which comma, or if it was which and it needed a comma, then when you added the comma, it struck out the whole word and then re-added the word with the comma or vice versa. So that's most of those you'll probably see if there's just a word that got erased or struck out and then replaced again. That's why it did that funky thing. <coughs> um, and the last thing I'll, I'll just mention is administratively, this is the first of two hearings. Uh, if, you, if anyone has comments, they're welcome to comment now or in two weeks or to email anyone um, in the interim. Uh, you, you, the council, still have powers to make changes. Uh, if you do not make any substantial changes, then you may adopt these following the hearing on the 25th. If you do make changes, then we'll go from there, but if there's substantial changes. So I guess with that, I'll take questions and public comment. Uh, Jack. I'm interested in the uh, in a slope, uh, steep slopes interim change because it's been in effect for a few months now. Have, uh, have you had cases 
come in where uh, where that's made a difference in uh, in approvals? Yeah, we've had a number of cases where that actually uh, came up. We haven't had too many with the land, new landscaping rules, but we have had, I would say, at least three or four applications on the slopes. Um, a number of projects had actually been held up because they needed a retaining wall or they needed something that couldn't get replaced because it was more than a 30% slope. So it's, and it's working the way you uh, intended it to work? It's working well. There's a, some additional changes that are in, um, in here that will make, make it even a little bit better. Okay, thanks. Other comments? Any comments from the public on these changes? Okay. Uh, so I think uh, we are probably ready then to close the public hearing on this. Uh, and uh, I think we need to set uh, the um, second public hearing. Is there a motion regarding a uh, second public hearing on these changes? I move that we uh, set a second public hearing for our, our next uh, scheduled meeting. Great. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. What happened to the calendar? calendar? Oh, good question. Don't know. Make a note. We'll find out. Okay. It was missing last week. Fair enough. All right, so we have a couple appointments to make. Um, uh, so one is to the Historic Preservation Commission, and uh, to that uh, body, uh, we had, a, a, I think it's one uh, vacancy, and uh, one person applied, and Sarah Smith applied. I know you're here. Would you like to come introduce yourself to the council? I am really called Sally Smith. Oh, um, I live in Murray Hill in District 2. Um, I have served at the interface of history, art, and civil government for most of my life. And um, lived in Middlesex for 20 years and was Justice of the Peace and served on the Board of Civil Authority and was town moderator briefly. And um, during that time, I built and renovated a number of old houses in the central Vermont area. So I'm familiar with some of the architectural history of the, of the area. Um, I've lived in a number of places in Pacific Grove, California. I served on the Planning Commission, which was rife with arguments and discussions about historic preservation. Um, so I'd like to put some of that experience to use here. I must confess I was interested primarily in the, the plans, maybe, of um, the renovation or resurrection of the house at the corner by the, by the circle out there, Route 2 Circle. Oh, the, the Five Home Farm Way? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's me. Great. If you have any questions, I'm happy to. Yeah. Any questions? Great, thanks. Thanks. Um, all right, is uh, there a, um, either a motion to go into executive session or an um, appointment or whatever you'd like? I move that we appoint Sally Gidding Smith to the Historic Preservation Commission. For, we have a second. All right, further discussion? All, right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, all right, so we have um, uh, uh, another appointment to make, which is uh, amongst our, ourselves, but I um, felt like there might be some questions about it. So uh, there's a, a going to be a committee sponsored by the uh, school board to look into the future of the Main Street Middle School uh, building, uh, and the future uh, potential use of that building. Is there, um, and they're looking for someone from the council to um, serve on that committee. Is there uh, any questions about that or anyone who is interested in serving on that? I would like to nominate Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> I did speak to her about it. Before. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, is anyone else in interested? Uh, Lauren, are you willing to serve? 
I, I am willing to serve, obviously, with young children who will go through the middle school. I'm very interested. Also, am cautious about new commitments. So if somebody else is eager, I would also <laughs> happily <laughs> let somebody else who also has children, <laughs> grandchildren in the school system. <laughs> I'm also interested. I've talked to Andrew Stein about about it and uh, about what the approach is. And um, so I would also be happy to do it. Oh, gosh. I don't want to push away someone who wants to do it. Well, what, what, would, you, what would you rather? So if given, you want it, I will step back. But given, you don't. <laughs> given that my five-year-old at dinner tonight was like, Mommy, do you have to go to city council no. meeting? Maybe I'll let Jack take it. <laughs> I'm with my children. <laughs> I twisted her arm a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Nobody else was interested. Is there, is there anyone else interested? No? I'll make a motion to appoint Jack <laughs> to the okay. Montpelier Middle Main Street Middle Mid School Committee. Great. Any Second. further? Oh, thank you. Um, any further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Well, thank you, Jack, and uh, thank you for working that out. <laughs> okay. Make sure you stay involved. Okay. It's always the parents' group. All right, so I think we are up to um, a discussion about uh, the Responsible Employer Ordinance. Um, and I, I think this was something that um, Councillor Connor Casey brought to us. So I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce it, um, and then I'm sure we'll have some good discussion. Good. No, that's great. Really appreciate it. And, um, you know, appreciate both the mayor and the council taking this up. I know we discussed it quite a bit. We had a previous hearing on this and set this as a priority for the council goals at our retreat here. So look forward to getting in the weeds a little bit, looking at the specific language. But I will start off by saying this is an issue I feel very strongly about. Um, in my career, I've always represented sort of frontline workers. And uh, what I notice is we've got a lot of buildings going up in Montpelier right now. Um, we have the transit center. We have a possible parking garage. We have a wastewater treatment plant, um, we, which is sort of inviting a new set of workers into our town. A set of workers, I think, has been largely invisible nationwide. Um, if we look at how they've been treated, I think this is a group that's been um, sort of abandoned by the federal government. Um, if you look at the Davis-Bacon Act, it isn't what it once was, and we can actually see people or risking their lives working on construction sites with a wage that would be less than what we would want as minimum wage, maybe 12 bucks an hour, right? We have a state government who sought to essentially eliminate the Department of Labor and merge it with the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, and that has opposed, I think, almost any initiative to help these frontline workers at every point here. So when we look at ourselves as municipal government, I think it's easy to say, okay, this isn't our job. Somebody else can do it, you know. Uh, the Department of Labor can certainly do it uh, and enforce it. But I believe, and I'm proud as the city of Montpelier, that we've sort of taken a stand on issues like climate change by setting energy efficiency standards that go above and beyond what state and federal government has done looking at non-U.S. citizen voting, which I believe only 13 other municipalities in the entire country has done. Um, the Responsible Contracting Ordinance um, is certainly a, um, you know, in-depth proposal that goes above and beyond um, what other municipalities have done in Vermont. But I think it's important to look at um, and actually consider these folks, because even though they might not be Montpelier residents, um, they deserve to be treated uh, with the same standards that we treat our own workers, uh, of which we have three uh, collective bargaining units in our own city government. Uh, and I'm really happy that, you know, we're looking at a personnel policy uh, to make sure we take care of the rest of the workers in our government. And I believe anybody we contract, anybody who receives a dime of taxpayer money, deserve to be treated with the respect uh, and make sure they can put food on their table, just like our own municipal workers here. Um, I want to commend our city staff. I think uh, we, we've done a much better job um, just after talking to folks uh, about making sure that things are transparent on some of these work sites uh, and make sure we, we, we help out these workers. 
Uh, that said, I, I don't think um, that's a reason for it not to be codified in an ordinance and actually cemented so that any future city staff uh, would also make sure we hold this to the same standard. Um, I only got a, a really brief chance to look at the memo by Sue Allen as she was going out the door, and I know we have another set of proposals. So uh, again, grateful to the Department of Public Works for also supporting this initiative. Um, I, I, I think we can work, again, to hammer out some of the details. Uh, but yeah, go, going forward, um, I have invited a few folks from the building trades who actually are on some of these sites and see what happens from a first-person perspective. Um, I know there was the recommendation to uh, talk to the uh, AGC, uh, the general contractors there. I would point out that you know the vice president of the general contractors is uh, also an employee of DEW, who is one of our biggest contractors in town here. So I, I think they should have a voice at the table and should be invited to any public hearing should we choose to set it tonight. Uh, but again, I, I always prefer to hear from frontline workers. It is a very dangerous job. Um, I think we have examples statewide of wage theft, misclassification, discrimination based on somebody's gender or race in some of these jobs. Um, and again, I think we have the ability to address it and it won't be easy. Uh, but again, that's not the approach we usually take on issues and I don't think there's any reason uh, we might not be provocative here and set the standard for other municipalities um, to really look at this in depth. The language I submitted uh, was based on Portland, Maine, and I, I think it would be beneficial, as uh, Sue Allen recommended, of maybe having the mayor of Portland uh, testify over the phone if we do a public hearing and see how, in, re you know, in reality, it has played out in the last couple of years, and I think you'll find that unlike some of the myth, myths perpetrated by the opponents of an ordinance like this, uh, this really doesn't result in higher uh, rates for that would discourage uh, and have a chilling effect for people to you know bid on some of these contracts. Um, I, I've asked the building trades to actually go into some examples of that, and how in some cases this has actually saved money uh, by having professional employees um, who are committed to the job. And hopefully, you know, paying a wage that would allow somebody who is, you know, a plumber, a pipe fitter, somebody doing this dangerous work in our town, paying them a wage, giving them the benefits that they can actually live in our community. Um, because right now, I could not find anybody who's working on one of these projects who would come and testify. Because everybody I've spoken to has said they can't afford to live in Montpelier. So I think we have an opportunity to change that. So I know that's a bit of a... <laughs> Long introduction, Mayor, so I apologize. No, no, it's fine. Uh, but again, I, I have invited some people who I think can uh, be bigger experts on this than myself, having never been up, worked in construction, and uh, answer um, a lot, if not all, of the questions that was put in that memo recently. So thanks very much, everybody. Great, thank you. Um, so I know there are some folks here who might want to speak on this topic. Um, I, we'd love to hear from you, um, number one. Number two, um, I know we've got um, probably a lot of questions that you know we want to dig into. Um, and uh, so I think we could probably do both of those things. Um, I think it probably makes sense uh, if there's just some general comments that um, folks would like to make on this. Um, I think now would be a good time, and then we'll we'll get into some of the weeds um, on this topic. So, um, I, uh, Connor, is there anyone in particular that that you were like, you know, I've in, invited these people here to, you know, like I yeah, just want to make sure uh, I were giving them. Danielle and uh, Larry and Tim, I know I was I was able to send them a copy of the okay. questions um, yesterday. Okay. So they probably have some answers, but um, Danielle, maybe you would want to kick it off, or, or Larry. Yeah, I can go. Cool. And you're welcome to be here or sit at the table. Either way is fine. I'll stand here. Great. Okay. Thanks. Um, yes, thank you for having us back here to continue the, this very important conversation. I'm Danielle Bombardier. I live in Colchester. Um, I'm an electrician, an organizer, and a member of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 300. Being a part of the IBEW, I knew that I always made the same amount of money as any other apprentice or journey worker at the same level as me, not 84 cents to my male coworker's dollar. I enjoy employer-paid health insurance and an employer-contributed retirement account. 
This is because I was fortunate to work for a responsible contractor. And the reason they were and still are responsible is because they signed an agreement with the union. They are contractually bound to be responsible, to pay a decent wage and provide benefits, to properly classify and register apprentices, and to provide a safe working environment. The union contract is one example of responsible contractor language and has proven effective over the course of history in strengthening the middle class. However, it's not the only way to ensure responsible contracting. This ordinance is another opportunity to provide necessary benefits to hardworking men and women. Think for a minute about the money that Montpelier taxpayers spend and want to spend to build and improve the capital city. If you can visualize these projects now, visualize the workers showing up every day to work on city improvements. Men and women in hard hats and car hearts constructing buildings and making infrastructure improvements that will last for decades after the job is complete. Most likely, these workers, depending on who they are, are not paid particularly well, nor offered paid benefits, and have little say in whether or not their hours are counting toward a registered apprenticeship program. I have met with countless helpers in my role as training director for the IBW who were promised apprenticeship wages and education but saw no follow through. I've also had conversations with long-term employees of companies. They may be offered a health insurance benefit, but some of that cost would come out of their pay. At an average pay of $24 an hour for a licensed electrician in the state, I can tell you most cannot afford to lose any of them, even if it means going without health insurance. Montpelier has an opportunity to set an example for the state. The city website states that Montpelier has a strong job market that pays living wages and recognizes that to be prosperous, the Montpelier community must care for the physical and mental well-being of all residents. Your community, the taxpayers and you, the elected officials, have a responsibility to ensure that anyone working on projects paid for with community dollars are offered a livable wage and proper benefits to ensure their well-being. As Connor mentioned, to treat those that work in your city with the same respect that you treat the residents that live here. The Vermont prevailing wage <clears throat> includes a percentage currently at 42.5% above the set wage, and I saw you had a packet here that included the prevailing wage. So uh, the wages actually are 42.5% higher um, to account for the fringe benefits. And states without strong prevailing wage laws spend more on social welfare benefits for these workers. Uh, yes, there's a state prevailing wage law that currently exists. It was passed right here in Montpelier. However, no town or city in Vermont has adopted a responsible contractor ordinance to strengthen and build upon the state law. And this really needs to happen. This state must do more to increase wages for some of the hardest working Vermonters. These are folks, including myself, who travel hours on the road to get to job sites, then work eight to 12 hours on site, typically outside in grueling conditions as we all know in Vermont, performing manual labor, requiring years of training and skill. Pretty much a college degree to become a licensed trades person. I know that Vermont can do better. And the capital city has an opportunity to prove that. The facts are available. Larry will address some of those. The stories are out there. Vermont needs you, elected officials and leaders, to push this forward in order to give a better quality of life to its citizens working in construction. We build this city, but we can't afford to live in it. On behalf of the IBW and the Vermont Building and Construction Trades Council, I strongly support this responsible contractor ordinance, and I encourage you all to do the same. Thanks. Just a quick question. Thank you. Danielle, yeah. I just yeah. very quick question. I, just, I want to make sure I understood. You said we, the state passed a law for this, but that no city has adopted it. Does that mean that the state has to do this on it's, their uh, It's for state money. So, so state, the state's already doing this on their project? Yes, $100,000 okay. or more of capital okay. funds. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Nice to 
see you all again. Hope you guys are had a good summer. I think Just there pull was the mic over. over. Thanks. I think there was snow on the ground the last time I was here. <laughs> Um, last week, wasn't it? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> it could have been this week, actually, one yeah. of a couple of those highs. But uh, my name is Larry Moquin. Um, I live in Swanton, and I work with the Laborers International Union of uh, North America. I'm here tonight to support this responsible employer ordinance. To refresh your guys' memories, um, I'm a fifth-generation Vermonter. Very proud of it. I grew up in a union ho household here in Vermont. I uh, graduated from Winooski High School in 1996. I jumped around from dead-end job to dead-end job once I graduated, and then when I was 20, my father forced me to join the union. Best decision that, or, that he made for me <laughs> ever. Um, my pay immediately increased as soon, obviously, I mean, you guys know. Um, but the problem was is I had to leave the state to work because the opportunities for the laborers in Vermont and the union aspect is very slim to none. Um, this ordinance, a big portion of it, is the attachment of the prevailing wages to the city-funded projects. There's some myths that claim that attaching prevailing wages will uh, cost taxpayers up to 20% more for the construction projects. Um, I'm going to debunk this. There's some statistics from uh, Smart Cities Prevail. It's a nonprofit, nonpartisan research and educational organization. Um, they receive their information from peer-reviewed empirical studies that are performed by respected academic organizations, and they definitely contradict the idea of that. Um, based on a 2012 Census of Construction survey, labor costs for construction only account for about 17% of the project. So uh, let's just say we're going to save 20% on this project by cutting wages for the workers. Um, You're going to have to either not pay them or pay them well below federal minimum wages. Um, state, states in this country that have weak or no prevailing wage standards spend $367 million a year on food stamps and earned income tax credits for construction workers only. And that's more than the states that have strong prevailing wage laws, which I believe there's 30 of them right now. Um, the workers in those states with the strong laws actually can contribute over $5.3 billion more a year in federal taxes than the, than the workers with the weak or no prevailing wage laws. Um, prevailing wages will actually strengthen local economies, and these studies are shown because they hire locally and uh, raise wages of the middle class workers. And in turn, that boosts the economy, creating uh, other jobs in different sectors other than the construction sector. Um, it's found that for every dollar paid in prevailing wages, it produces uh, $1.50 in economic activity. Um, prevailing wage construction workers are also more likely to have health insurance and less likely to live in poverty. Nationally, the veterans that we all care about work constructions at higher rates than non-veterans. And in prevailing states with these laws, this number is even higher and uh, poverty amongst these veterans employed with the building trades in these states decreases by as much as 31%. Um, by passing this ordinance, uh, I believe Montpelier will be supporting local workers, spurring the economy, uh, excuse me, the economy, and even help to cut tax taxpayer costs such as welfare subsidies. I know all of you here, as members of the council, as the city manager, assistant city clerk, you guys want to be fiscally responsible with the taxpayer dollars of the residents here in Montpelier, but I encourage you guys to consider the importance of the social responsibilities you have too and pass this ordinance. And that's all I have for you, and I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? No. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Uh, my name is Dennis LeBrownie uh, from Lindenville, and I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, speak briefly on this uh, on, on this ordinance. Uh, just for the record, uh, uh, we are uh, 10,000 union members strong here in Vermont, and uh, that we do s uh, support this ordinance. Um, as uh, Councilman uh, Connor Casey 
I alluded to earlier about how dangerous the jobs are in construction. And as you may recall, we had a number of people that were either killed or seriously injured uh, out on the highways this year uh, performing uh, these construction jobs. And I, I highly doubt they were getting paid prevailing wage, wages or even had uh, you know, benefits uh, that, uh, for health care or any other benefits that may be uh, out there. Uh, and also, um, as you know, Danielle said, um, I was at the State House uh, working when they passed prevailing wage for the state. And um, I think it's the, you know, it is the right thing to do uh, to make sure that our workers are getting uh, a livable wage, uh, just like minimum wage. Uh, I'm also at the State House supporting uh, minimum wage. Uh, we need to put uh, money into people's pockets uh, so that they would have the funds to pay the rent. I'm sure Montpelier uh, uh, um, is also is an, um, has, has high rent, just like every place else in the state. It is hard for especially young people to find uh, a place to rent. Uh, young families. Uh, we have many people that are on social programs. Uh, paying a livable wage would help ease, ease that. Uh, so uh, again, I just want to uh, uh, reiterate that we do support this and uh, we hope that you will pass this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Hi folks. My name is David Van Dusen. and I'm a union rep with AFSCME, AFSCME Local 1369 in the city of Montpelier between home health care providers, uh, Kellogg Hubbard Library, and uh, support staff at the school. We represent more than 50 employees here in Montpelier. We also support this ordinance strongly and as public, for the most part, public sector employees, we feel very strongly that public money needs to be spent in the public good. And so the city of Montpelier, in our opinion, should not be putting taxpayer money towards jobs which are essentially paying poverty wages. We need to support a uh, livable wage. We need to support this ordinance. And we need to have a sustainable economy here in Montpelier. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hello. Good evening. Uh, my name is Daniel Bovin. Uh, I'm a direct product of everything that these three people just mentioned. Uh, I'm a new father. I've been a union worker for seven years now. Um, we recently just moved into Northfield. We bought our own house. Um, none of this would be possible if I wasn't a strong union member. I, I, try, I get up every morning at 4 o'clock in the morning. I have to walk my dog, take care of my child, drive an hour to work, sometimes an hour and a half depending on where the job site is. And then I'm going to work for the next 10 hours in the heat or the cold. And all I want to do all day is go home to my son. But I have to put in these hours in order to make the life that I want for my son. And none of it would be possible if I didn't make the, the prevailing wage that everyone here is talking about tonight. So I really, I really support this bill or whatever that, you know, whatever that is. I'm not a very political person, so. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I strongly support it. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Any other comments? Well, and as we go, we can, if there's more comments to be made, we can certainly continue to, the conversation. Um, I, I would actually love to um, invite Donna Barlow Casey up, um, if you don't mind, because um, you um, made some, some comments here um, uh, about the ordinance, and I, um, I'm sure everyone had a, well, actually, did everybody have a chance to read them? Just saw like half an hour ago. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, well, and no, fair enough. So um, especially since they were sort of uh, new, if, would you mind just like summarizing some of your comments? And, and then um, I know I've got some, some questions for you, so. Sure. There. Um, so first, this was a collective um, endeavor by um, the team in the Public Works Department. We are in support of a livable wage. Um, we did have some concerns about um, language that would be adopted so that it would um, reflect um, practices and procedures that were clear, understandable, and 
consistent with how we operate job sites. Um, and, um, and so that basically set the tone for thinking about um, what we had seen in the ordinance and what we would suggest um, would be workable um, in response to that. So if you, um, and I can just go down the bullet points if you want. Well, I might as well just ask my, my sure. questions, I suppose. Um, so I was very interested in the comment you made that you thought that this would um, simplify um, the processes involved. Um, that's, that's very interesting. Could you just describe how this ordinance might actually simplify your processes? So I, um, the prevailing wage rates, and I um, provided a copy of just one of the pages, um, have a variety of levels depending on the job at hand. And if there was a rate that was the base rate no matter what job you were doing, it would provide that livable ground wage for everybody. So even if the prevailing rate at the lowest end was less than that, it would not affect the prevailing rate if it were higher than that. It would just be a minimum standard that the city could budget for and bank on. And so that's how we were looking at that um, situation. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, um, are there any other questions? I don't wanna ho hog time here too, if you all have questions as well. No, uh, uh, go ahead, Glenn. I mean, it may be getting too far ahead of ourselves, but uh, looking at the sample sheet of uh, prevailing wage rates, you're right, there's a whole range of them and there's a lot of them and you say this is only one sheet of many. Yes. Um, do you have a sense uh, what a reasonable base rate, like did you have something in mind when you said base rate? Obviously that's for us to determine, but right. um, are we looking at the highest numbers here or the lowest in a way? We didn't get, we, did, we didn't want to put that out. Uh, we can certainly think about that, but we didn't get into that level of discussion um, today. Go ahead. Sure. The, the other question um, that I had was, uh, I'm trying to find, Yes, uh, the, your second point um, in Section 6.4, add language uh, to make it apply to on-site laborers and not to other categories, for instance, office or administrative workers. Um, can you explain why, the, the, the reasoning behind that? From, so we did, we're not trying to discriminate against office or administrative workers, but we were trying to set the rate for those workers who were working on the job in the community here and not in another state or, um, so we were wrestling with that. That was the intent of that. We were. Thanks, that makes sense. Um, so I have a, another question about enforcement. So um, uh, I was feeling like I had a, a couple of um, uh, mixed messages on that point. Uh, there was, uh, you know, one comment from the city's questions that was like, you know, we have a hard time getting people to complete timesheets. This might be, um, you know, even more difficult. Um, what is your thought on? Um, on the enforcement of this, uh, again, is this uh, how how um, what does enforcement look like in your in your take on this? Is, um, it, is it is it relatively easy? Is it not relatively easy? We're envisioning that it should be relatively easy. Okay. That we hold the contractor accountable. Um, we didn't. What we were struggling with was. Um, 
requirements that would have people um, sign in and out, a daily um, review. Um, we're not a very large community in terms of our public works department. Um, we're feeling as if the number and the contracts that we award each year are not, um, we don't necessarily have to look at a daily sign in, sign out, validate that on the spot. We could do that in a weekly, monthly, preferably monthly situation where we're reviewing that kind of information. Um, better use of our staff's time and still having accountability. All the rest of my questions are basically um, uh, like, like language related. Um, they're uh, things that are logistics, um, basically, you know, things like, okay, so if we have um, basically a um, uh, wage that we're setting, then like how often does that get reviewed and who reviews mm -hmm. it? Um, or, um, uh, you know, actually in, in looking at um, the document that um, Michael Sherman submitted to us, um, which was full of great information, um, you know, the there was, um, a uh, clause or a portion of his uh, research that was about non-retaliation, and um, it occurred to me that that might be something that would be potentially relevant uh, to uh, to this document as well. Um, anyway, there's there's lots of um, sort of smaller uh, things that I. This, it doesn't feel like this is necessarily the right venue to talk about it because like these are things that we can figure out. Um, uh, at least that's where that's where I am at. Um, I will say though that one other thing that I am interested in is if uh, if it's not too um, uh, onerous a task, if if it were possible to collect a, a list of um, projects that we've done, let's say in the last year or perhaps um, I'm not sure how long how far we want to go back five years I don't know um, of uh, projects that this would have affected um, I mean I know that uh, you, you know if, if the state is doing this then uh, you know that that covers a certain subset of projects but there may be some other subset of projects that um, are not covered and again to to Michael's um, point in his uh, letter to us uh, you know, it may end up um, only affecting a, a very small number of workers, but um, I'll just say for um, my part anyway, I, I, if it's not, you know, causing us an extra FTE to review this, um, you know, if the, if the cost is not substantial, then it's, it's worthwhile even for the few number of workers. Um, but that's, I know I'm starting in, getting into like where, where I stand, but um, uh, I'm sure you all, Others may have questions or want to express what how, how they're feeling. So, um, unless Peter, did you have something you want to add? Yeah, if I if I might, um, I, I was on the uh, social and economic yourself? justice committee. Peter Kalman, I was on the social and economic justice committee when uh, Michael wrote that report, and he's not here tonight. Oh, he so he's here. He's oh, here. Oh, oh, there he is. Oh. <laughs> all right. Okay. All right. All right. Then I'm I'm going to skip the part I didn't see him. Sorry. All right. So, but I, I just think there's some things that need to be cl cl discussed, not tonight. But notice the language. We've heard prevailing wage, living wage, minimum wage, and now flat base rate. And some of the same people have even used two different Both, terms. Yeah. We have to be really clear when we do this what we're talking about. Secondly, this is called here a responsible employer ordinance. Somebody said, oh, it's actually a responsible um, contra contract ordinance because this particular one only seems to apply to contractors. And that's where this conversation, are we talking about just the workers or also the people in the office? And then what about other um, community contracts? This, this seems to be about contractors. But again, very important to be clear about that. The issue that Bill asked about, the state law applies to state monies being expended. It doesn't apply to, uh, to city uh, monies being expended. Lots of projects have both in them. 
Right. So my the reason for my question actually was, if they have both monies in them, or if actually if they have federal monies too, then we have to follow the rules of those people. So one of what I wasn't completely sure about was if we're already having to do this for projects with state funding, then A, the contractors already know how to do this, and B, we're already managing it anyway. So I, I wasn't clear about that until Danielle said that. So that's I just want to be sure that we weren't creating something that contractors aren't already used to working with. Right. So just as you go forward, be sure about it's a Venn diagram. There are some pr projects that are or people who won't be covered just because of, the, of, of where the monies lie. And then f finally, I think, th and this is where maybe Michael will have more to say about it, but it's clear that this kind of uh, an ordinance has symbolic value, the, the leadership and so forth. It is less clear in a municipality of our size whether or not it would affect that many people. And that is something that needs to be weighed. It needs to be thought about. Uh, there's not a simple answer to that. That's a sort of a moral, ethical, and financial decision. So I just would urge that this kind of, th this, this ordinance be looked at very carefully from all these perspectives and that you do bring in some of the people from the contract industry, not just the union people, and that you also bring in lower income people who might not benefit from something like this at all because if they were to earn more, they would fall into the, a, a, a benefits gap. So these are some things that need, need to be considered as well. It's a, it's a complicated, it's a very symbolically important ordinance, but only if unintended consequences don't result. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments from council, um, questions or otherwise? Donna. A core question, I'm not sure, maybe it's Larry who I'm asking, but it could be any anybody. Um, the data comes from large cities that I read in, in the materials. And some of that was, in my mind, I was reading Michael's about livable wage. But likewise, I believe you quoted a study of 2012, 2013. There's nothing more current. And is there anything to, about small communities like us? This, this, this if you would uh, can we, can come up to the mic, mic so we can uh, have the record of what you're saying. Thanks. All this information All right. that I was uh, Sorry, hang on one second. Ashley, did you have something you want to say? I just wanted to clarify. Donna, you were looking for information from like comparably sized areas. Is that what you were asking about? I'm asking if he had any to present. Yes. Um, so he's referring me to a website. It's small, smallcitiesprevail.org. Okay. That's the actual. Um, because what they say is with smaller cities and bi bigger cities, it all equals out. I mean, if we're going to go with Vermont, there is not a big city here. It's not even a small city. <laughs> right. So, I mean, I don't know if we can use that a as an example of maybe a city of 8,000, but, I mean, mm -hmm. and we can't use Portland, Maine as, because they're 200,000. Right. But it has proven mm -hmm. to not raise costs, because what actually happens is the fuel and the materials go down because there's less uh, work order changes, um, redos of things because of the more skilled workforce that is brought in to the community mm -hmm. and these are more career jobs instead of just disposable jobs because you have to think these construction workers only have so long until their body's going to give out on them. So if oh, you don't absolutely. pay them, yep. if you don't yep. pay them now, you're going to pay for them later. And yep. what we're doing now is paying for them now and we're going to pay for them later. So um, Yeah, but it's not I wasn't thinking so much as increasing costs, which is how you were using the statistics, but more to the point that Peter made of unknown consequences for people who are going are in that gap and who are going to lose benefits, but yet the, the, the prevailing wage or whatever we label it isn't quite bringing them up enough. So that's all. I'm just looking at unintentional if, consequences. If you use David, Davis bacon rates in this state, then uh, you're not going to do anything. The state prevailing wage has done the, the legwork to see what you need to because there's three separate areas there's the metropolitan area mm -hmm. south and then 
it's called the North, which is you know Montpelier, Washington County, Northeast Kingdom, and there's three separate rates. Okay. Um, that's what the state has found to be what a good rate for each individual classification will be. So, so instead of a flat rate that everybody, nobody's below this, the state has put out right. rates if you're according a labor, to classifications. Yes, if you're a laborer, you get paid this. If that you're out. an electrician, mm -hmm. if you're a flagger, you get paid this. But so you'll look at just say a laborer in Montpelier, I think it would be 1732 an hour right now is what the state prevailing wage is plus 42.5% for their fringe benefits of that 1732. Mm -hmm. The federal Davis-Bacon rate in Montpelier for all the highway projects, which will still say the same, I believe, because um, the state pretty much attaches 2,000 bucks from the federal government to everything, mm -hmm. so they can use the federal Davis-Bacon wages, um, is only 12 dollars cents, uh, 12, $12 and I think the fringe is maybe a buck. Ooh. So, I mean, there's a problem. I mean, Chittenden County is even worse than that. So that's pretty bad to say. It's just if these surveys are not done by contractors, wages never go up. And the only contractors that do them are union contractors because they know the benefits. This $12, they, a flagger in southern Vermont, federal Davis-Bacon is below Vermont minimum wage right now, like what the Davis-Bacon says they should pay. So, I mean... This is just nothing that you guys would have ever known because why would you, you know? Um, just like I don't know everything that you guys <laughs> are talking about tonight. <laughs> I, right. I know, but there, there is this aspect, again, and, and trying to look at the, is that Montpelier does pay a lot that support non-Montpelier residents. Exactly. And if you're telling me you can't afford to live here and yet I'm supporting you on a prevailing wage. That's money that's going out of town. So you're living in a community that's cheaper because they don't do the same thing. So that's all. No, you know, and they I don't understand. have whether, whether it's the water, the sewer, the street sidewalks being plowed. They just they have a whole different level of their community. So as we're putting out, you know, we just need more people here. Right, to and help by us raising the it. wages, you might be able to get more people attracted to the city because. Could. I mean, Calvin, you, you Calvin could, used to yeah. live here but had to move because the wages weren't feasible for him to continue to live here, and he would like to live here if he could. Mm -hmm. um, he travels to New Hampshire every day to work right now because we don't have any work in this state, and he has to do that because he wants to have benefits in a retirement. Right. Well, sorry, I can't help you with that right now. But, <laughs> <laughs> but thank that's, you. that's thank what you. The, this is all about. Is yep. And all the, this has been done in other cities, and that website should be able to answer some yeah, of your thank questions. You. That's good to know. And I actually have some answers for the other questions from earlier, the 17 questions. Okay. So, anything else? Uh, Jack. Before you sit down, I just want to, I think you misspoke. You said smallcitiesprevail.org. It's smartcitiesprevail.org. Smart, you're right. <laughs> Smart city, sorry. Don't, I don't want people to go looking for the wrong place and right. just get a get well, a knock, I appreciate knock down. That. Did Google help you find that correction? No, I was already at Smart Cities. <laughs> um, uh, Lauren, and then I have one more question for Donna. <laughs> so I was wondering for um, the issue was raised by the staff about the tracking of information, and I was just trying to get a better sense of how on a site like this, how is the data tracked typically? Is what's in the ordinance, does that follow kind of best practices? And I think there's a question of kind of, are we asking for information that's not already collected? It's one thing. And then there's the level of oversight by the city of that is a different question. So I just kind of ground truthing from, we have experts here that might be able to speak to kind of, how is data usually collected and are, does this language kind of jive with what's really done on the job sites right now? Um, I am Tim LeBombard, president of IBW Local 300. Uh, I know our contractors, because they have apprenticeships, uh, they have to follow OSHA regulations and they have to follow our construction bargaining agreement, which uh, they're required to send in reports monthly. They, they do that and then some daily it's part of the business and most contractors should be following all of that stuff OSHA requires you you know who's on your job site that day anytime anywhere so I know one of the questions was like we can't even get the people to sign a time card 
it's a hell of a way to run a business, you know, if something's wrong, something's broke. And I just while I'm here, Peter brought up this subject, I think he was probably talking about the fiscal cliffs, where somebody getting more money wouldn't get social welfare. Well, the 42.5% above and beyond that hourly wage should be enough to cover the health care. That's what it's there for, for pensions, health care, whatever. And if the contractor isn't supplying it and the people are buying it, they have to pay them in the check. But, you know, it's, it's just an equivalent. But all those forms, and they're out there, and it's daily business. And this day and age, you can't do anything about a paper trail or, or some form. Thank you. Um, Don, I have a question yes. for you. Um, so again, just referring to um, Michael's document um, and the research he did uh, with conversations with um, Burlington, who has a sort of similar um, uh, ordinance. Uh, so it sounded like they do uh, sort of just random uh, audits. Um, and uh, so just in terms of uh, the city's enforcement, is that some? Uh, is that something you, you would picture us uh, doing with, with something like this, or is there a different sort of monitoring or, or enforcement mechanism? So um, I can't, um, I don't want to suggest that we had an in-depth conversation about this aspect of it. That's fair. Um, and, um, but what we, and so we did talk about definitely maybe monthly basis mixed with um, uh, random samplings. What we were trying to shy away from and probably could be wordsmithed better because this was um, pulled together today in between yep. other things, um, would be um, we don't want to have to be on the job site at the end of the day validating the paperwork that was was taken care of during that day by the contractor or by the on-site manager, by the people who were working. Um, we know that happens on a regular basis, but we just don't have the staff bandwidth to do that. And, it, and we had seen that in some of the other ordinances or suggested language that we were looking at. So we need to move towards what we do want. Um, and I, and I don't have a definitive answer for that that's, right now. That's okay. Well, because for me, that no, comes back to love. Oh, sorry. I, go ahead, Ashley. Oh, sorry. That's all good. Go ahead. I, I, think, I think the important piece here, too, is there's also like a breach of contract. So, you know, there is, the company would be assuming the risk of litigation, you know, because they're in breach of contract. So, uh, you know, I... I think we do have to have some way, and you know, I would say like giving notice about you know when an audit's going to take place or whatever is probably not the way to go about it. But you know, like you may be subject to an audit of the following items, you know, or you will be subject to an audit, you know, once every 12 calendar months, and you know that will be, you know, will provide you with X number of days notice of that or, or something along those lines. But I. I I don't think it would be wise to put anyone at the risk of that daily, you know, monitoring in this situation unless, you know, un unless we get a situation that arises where there is significant concern, but. Yeah. Um, so that sounds like an area we can continue to, to talk about. Um, any other, other comments at this point? So my thought is that we should probably um, have uh, some further conversation about this, uh, look at some of the language, see if there's um, some tweaking that can be done or some just like getting into some of the details. Um, uh, and so I imagine there may be a, a group of people that might want to hammer that out together. Uh, Connor, do you have yeah. any thoughts on this? Yeah, go ahead. No, I don't, like, honestly, I think city staff's recommendations are, you know, pretty helpful and uh, I don't think we're that far apart yeah. except for obviously the uh, you know the question that was raised is the what is the responsible rate you know what does that floor look like uh, but I'd be happy to 
sort of take out the draft, maybe talk to people from the city of Portland, answer any questions. And I guess with that, I'd make a motion to schedule the first public hearing for uh, our next meeting, September 25th. I think two weeks is ample time to hammer some of these details out. That <laughs> I'm going to assume that's a, that's a second. <laughs> mm -hmm. I will say that sounds a little fast to me. Um, I mean, I think it's possible. Um, I, uh, I don't know, other thoughts. <laughs> I mean, if you want to, yeah, th thoughts on that, Connor? I mean, other than the responsible rate, I think most of this information is at our fingertips and honestly take a few days to hammer out it. <laughs> yeah, Donna. Well, after you hammer it out, I'd like more time to read it than I've had to read these. So I would appreciate more time. But Do, how would you feel about, because um, I know you want to like get moving on it. Um, what if we didn't, you were saying it for our next meeting. Um, what if we set it just for the meeting after that? Just give ourselves like a I, month. I just, yeah. so I think from staff, that would be great. And also I think we have a pretty long meeting at the next meeting. So that's otherwise, I mean, I, th oh, I agree yeah. with you. We're not that far off, but it would be, mm -hmm. But it's, I, keeping it moving would be good. I'll, I'll amend my motion for a month from okay. uh, October cool. 9th. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, fair enough. Uh, and uh, Ashley, that's okay with you if it's uh, what the October, what did we say, 9th meeting? Yeah. Okay. Great. Because I, I think that does keep it, keep it moving, but it gives us a little <laughs> time to set some meetings and have some conversations. So, right. yeah, cool. Um, thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, there's been a, Motion and a second. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Donna. There is one piece that I would like you to look at that it says no independent contractors. I yeah. really disagree with that because it's not just construction workers. And anyway, so I, that to me needs a lot further definition. Okay. We'll grab okay. a coffee and chat about it. Yeah, maybe some tea. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Negotiating over beverages already. <laughs> Okay. Well, and thank you all for your um, thoughts and comments on this, and um, I keep the conversation going. Um, so the next item um, was a discussion of the livable wage ordinance, um, which was uh, slightly a, a slightly different thing. Fair yeah, enough. I think that's actually what Michael's comments were more addressed toward. Not to speak for Mr. Sherman, but it was more toward the notion of a livable wage ordinance, which. That did go to all of our contractors, but I... Uh, Would you like to come up and make any comments, blended, Michael? Maybe they're similar. I don't know. They, they, they seem similar, but not, not quite. Anyway, but yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, I just... I'm just My, Michael Sherman. M I live in Montpelier. And I'm here, um, I suppose, as a representative of the, the um, Social and Economic Justice Committee, Advisory committee, advisory <laughs> <laughs> committee, uh, and we got this request to to do some, you know, to to advise the give some information to the council on the question of a livable wage, um, and I want to be very clear. I I don't consider myself an expert on this. Uh, what I know is what I found in a, a few weeks of, of reading, um, and and. Um, and that, that's pretty much, and that's now several months ago, and I'm of an age when several months ago might as well be a generation ago, <laughs> okay? So uh, I haven't heard anything that's inconsistent with what I presented to you through this memo. And I also want to say that this, this came, it, what the, we did not vote on this, but we voted to pass the memo along, okay? So we're not bringing a recommendation. We're sim we, were simply, we were simply forwarding this information. So I don't see anything that's inconsistent or, uh, in what I've heard up to now. What, um, what I do think is important in this is to look at the some of the information that um, talks about what you have to be careful about when you design an ordinance like this. And that's um, the material on pages uh, six and seven. That, you know, some basic, real basic questions. How far down, for example? Contractors, subcontractors, subcontract, sub subcontractors. How far down will the the ordinance, um, you know, be effective? Uh, and um, because that's that's one way to 
figure out how far the reach is in what you're doing. Um, the other, um, there are also questions about um, are there ex exemptions? And I, um, I did look at a few. There, there are. There, uh, Burlington has an ordinance that has been going on for several years now, and they have they write in they wrote into that ordinance ex exemptions um, that would be very important here. For example, we give money away to a whole bunch of nonprofits in the city, uh, and most nonprofits can't really being afford can't afford to be paying the kind of wages that are being offered at, at, at contract levels, and they're, they're just getting by. Um, so do you want to exempt them from, the, from this kind of ordinance, or do you want to somehow protect those workers as well? Um, and I think, obvious, I, I think actually um, there are more people working in the nonprofit sector in Montpelier than there are in construction and the for-profit center, and so that would be, a, this would, women. right. So that, um, that would be a really important uh, an important thing to look at, uh, how, far, how far down and how wide. And then there are questions about seasonal workers, uh, full-time workers, um, what constitutes continuity in a job, how many seasons before the person is counted is, is one way, you know, five, I think in one, in one case, five seasonal, seasonal jobs then makes a person eligible for the coverage under the livable wage, the livable wage ordinance um, that I that I that I read about, um, there were some, there were a few other things, but I urge you to take a look at pages six and seven as you start to um, craft what you're going to do with with uh, the ordinance that Connor has proposed. Um, uh, what I what I read confirms what what the, the folks before were saying that it, it does not have an adverse effect on the on the on the costs. Um, what I will add to that is the point that I did include, that it, it actually is to the benefit of uh, em the employers because their people stay longer and they are not involved in constantly replacing people and constantly training. And I'll give you a personal uh, example on this. My son is a paramedic working in a town outside of Chicago. That town pays paramedics $11.40 an hour. Consequently, the paramedics are in and out, and they are constant. They are understaffed. People are leaving. My son has to leave. He can't afford to live like that. Um, they're losing good paramedics. They have to start training them all over again. And so, one one benefit of a, an ordinance like this is that there is continuity on the job and expertise, and it means that everything goes more efficiently and smoothly, and you don't have interrupt, you don't have work interruptions. So I think that's one thing to add to what you've already heard. Um, and I didn't put that in the memo because that didn't seem like an appropriate place to, to put it, but um, it's something to keep in mind. Um, there are questions about methodology. I think the, um, the fact that there is the, this, this, um, this document which does provide information about what, who's getting what, uh, is helpful because one of the questions is who who discer determines what's a livable wage and how frequently do you revisit that? Um, I think Burlington does it every year. They ha they hire a panel of people to or one one or two people to do that. Um, the other important thing is to think about the costs of monitoring and enforcing and how that's going to be done. Uh, Burlington has uh, enforcement monitoring enforcement divided mostly in the attorneys, uh, in the city attorney's office, but also in the personnel office. Um, they, but the person I spoke to there um, said that they, actually much of this really can be done by not, not a paralegal, not a, doesn't didn't need to be a lawyer, um, but you do have to have somebody who has expertise m watching over this and, uh, and f figuring out who's in conformance, conformance. And then what do you do about it? Um, and, and how do you enforce? How do you enforce it? Another point that hasn't wasn't mentioned is how do you start to educate the contractors so that you you don't pull this uh, surprise on them all of a sudden? And so getting this information out as part of the bid packages is really important, and also um, educating the the workers uh, about their rights in this. So uh, um, I. I 
that's really all I can add. And uh, everything I know is here. <laughs> but I, well, there's one other thing, and that is when I, as I was do, going through this, I was I kept trying to find where are the voices of dissent, and I didn't find any. The only one is the panel that was convened by the state, and that that raised the question about what happens with the fiscal cliff. Okay. And that was the only voice of dissent that I heard. And I was looking through, through purposely in the literature to find it. And I think the, the absence of it is either negligence on my part or <laughs> not really good research uh, methodology, or that um, the, the people that I was reading weren't citing it, which is also a possibility, or that it, it's not really there. And uh, if I were to take more time to do this and had, a, had access to a much lo larger library, you know, I would work harder to see if I could find the dissent. But I didn't find any, and I think that's significant. Thank you. Um, and your comments are making me wonder about one other question. I guess it's it's honing a question really for me, um, which is uh, just the sort of the with something like the Responsible Employers Ordinance. Um, if we were to look backwards and say, you know, these are the handful of projects or wh whatever that this would have applied to, um, I know we don't necessarily have an enforcement mechanism now, but once that becomes clear, if we were if we were able to somehow estimate what that would cost us, um, because I mean, my one place where I was starting. Um, as a threshold for that was like, is this going to cost us an extra FTE? Which it sounds like it's not. Um, and it, it also sounds like it's going to be relatively minimal. You know, it, it might be like, you know, so many hours of someone's time over the course of a year or, or whatever. Um, and so my guess is that that number is going to be relatively small. And I, I don't know if that's an easy thing to, to estimate, but even just to having a ballpark um, number in that I think would be um, helpful. Um, um, yeah, Tom. Uh, Michael, you mentioned it didn't have to be a lawyer, but you inferred that it should like, be somebody with some paramedic, uh, paralegal uh, paralegal, right. uh, and, experience. And that was uh, Mr. St. James. Um, was That's his suggestion. He's the, he is the, the attorney okay. in the city attorney's office that I spoke with, had a long telephone conversation, and as I mentioned in the memo, I'd sent the questions in advance so that uh, uh, he could have some preparation. And what he said was, Mostly, this is stuff that a paralegal can manage. Uh, there, are, there are very few uh, I issues, incidents where they really had to call in a lawyer. Um, and it, I guess the one thing that I saw in your in your uh, draft was that I could see more opportunities for lawsuits in the in the way you wrote that. Than, than need to be than than would you would want and so I, I think it would be some you know important to start looking at at, at how you can minimize the conflict. Do you mean lawsuits against the city or yeah. against the employers? Both or, ways. Both ways. Okay. That it would be very valuable information. So we want you on this other committee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, at this point, I don't. I'm not sure that there's a whole lot of dif distance between the one yeah. the one document and the other. Um, and the other question I have for you is, um, you know, when I think about the, the Venn diagram of um, a living wage, livable wage uh, ordinance and the responsible employer ordinance that we just discussed, that Venn diagram is significantly overlapping for me, and I'm not sure, I'm not, I'm not sure that I could articulate um, how they might be different. Because have we have we effectively talked about um, the, you know, a living wage by having talked about the responsible employer ordinance. Yeah. One, one distinction yeah. I would make is the wage is one thing, but the responsible contractor or employer, you're right, we probably should get a uniform uh, definition of that. It, it goes well beyond just wages, the responsible contractor ordinance. It's okay. All right. The, the ordinance that Burlington has, and, the, and typically livable wage ordinances make a distinction between those contractors that offer health benefits and those that don't. So the livable wage number is higher for those contractors that don't offer uh, uh, health insurance to make up the difference. Okay. But you Thank you. That's very helpful. <laughs> uh, Jack. Thank you for all this work. I think it's great. One of the things that I would suggest is that we're hearing about the uh, 
danger of a benefits cliff um, and how does a per how do we confront that and uh, I know that uh, there are people where I work in my day job at Vermont Legal Aid uh, Vermont Legal Aid is a member of the Vermont Living Wage Coalition and I know that there are people at Vermont Legal Aid who are experts in uh, public benefits and probably could help us uh, address that question. You know, I'm pretty sure the Living Wage Coalition has, uh, has already addressed that in, uh, in advocating for uh, an increase in the state minimum wage. So uh, maybe afterwards we could talk about connecting with someone at, at Legal Aid who can, you know, I haven't done benefits work in years, but I know there are people who do it. Thank you. Also, I, that's great, Jack. But again, minimum wage is different than livable wage is different than a prevailing wage, and so you got to analyze those things very carefully. Minimum wage, the evidence is probably pretty clear. Well, I'm not even going to say, but you got to look at each of those. And Ann, the, diff, the one other big difference between uh, a responsible, besides what, what Connor said, which is that deals with what much much more the, about wages but also this is a contractor this is construction work this, these guys are talking about dangerous work outside blah 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 the livable wage for for in Burlington covers all subcontracting and that's why Michael is concerned about some of the nonprofits that 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 we give money to so the, the that's where that's where the Venn diagram really diverges. Thank you. Uh, uh, that brings up a follow-up question for me. Um, so, uh, you know, I think about our um, contract that we have with Just Basics. Um, uh, w would that fall under the? Um, oh, no, we do. Do we still have a contract? Well, with them? I know we sort of brought in. Catering? Yes, yes, that's that's one thing. Because I know we brought in uh, right. under our house basically right. a lot of their services, but, I but we, we have, still but we still contract for services. With right, them for, right, right. So depending on where we set thresholds, they could conceivably fall under this. Sorry if I'm not. Threshold. That's another thing to be thinking about. Is the threshold? Yeah. yeah. So it's you know as I'm thinking out loud here, this isn't a serious policy proposal. Sure. at this point but you know as, as we think about what's the the difference the distinction between the two maybe there's you know a big number that Connor's proposed and DPW that is this full contracting ordinance and then you know after that it just it goes to the lesser livable wage ordinance and then below that it's just what it is yeah. it's what it is now so that I mean we you know we're not going to hit everybody but at least we're trying to hit where we put our bigger dollars ease of administration and it becomes one regulation versus two. Yeah. That, is that something that we, you know, you all can incorporate into your conversations about tweaking this potentially? Or do you want to deal with that separately? Yeah. I mean, I, I really do believe they are two separate animals there, but I, no, I think it's worth a broader conversation okay. um, and talking about that. Again, I, I just, as Peter said, there's a distinction between uh, somebody hanging out on a beam all day, you know, and, and mm -hmm. some other nature of work. But, uh, yeah, I, I think it's a broader conversation. Well, and it also may make some sense uh, if this if this part of it, if the responsible employer part of it is uh, somehow uh, easier to uh, enforce or um, to think about as a first step, that it may be, maybe we, we do that first and see how it works and, and then s look into, uh, you know, the potential for broadening it or... Um, Having other thresholds, um, oh, I'm open to that too. So, yeah, go so ahead, Donna. You mean, I mean, in a couple of places it says procuring construction services, mm -hmm. but in other places it just talks about employer and contracts. So if you get more explicit about it, that might be a good place to start. If that's what you really mean is construction, right. and only construction. Yeah. yeah. Over two hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, fair. That that would narrow it certainly. Yeah. Thank you. Other comments or thoughts on this topic? Okay. Thank you. And thank you again, Michael, for your work on this. This was fabulously thorough and uh, um, easy to follow and, and um, 
anyway, it was very helpful. So thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, moving uh, along here. Um, we, uh, I think I said we were going to do uh, Chapter 9, Licenses, and then we were going to move on to uh, the event fees and then um, the appointment to the League of Cities and Towns. Um, just to clarify, are we? I, I don't know if we're keeping anyone here for the event fees um, that would otherwise be no, taking so. off. Okay. Um, just checking no, <laughs> before. I don't, I don't see anybody. Okay. Uh, great. So moving on to uh, Chapter Nine of the ordinances, licenses. Um, thoughts, comments on this, uh, Lauren. Um, two things kind of popped out at me. Um, one is on page or section nine eleven. Uh, which is dealing with licenses for inns, hotels, motels, and so on. Um, it just raised for me the question of how are we dealing with things like Airbnb at this point? Um, are, because the way it's described, I would think they would f actually fall under that. I don't imagine most are getting a license, and I just us having clarity on do we think they should or not, I think we would have to provide some clarity in this language to um, address it one way or the other. Great question. I had that same question myself. Uh, yeah, Connor. I'd like actually follow up question. Did Burlington tackle that recently? I thought the Airbnbs or so, so I think what, what's occurred with Airbnbs is that um, the state worked with Airbnb, so now they are collecting their, you know, meals, rooms and meals tax from them. And so we are, because we collect a local option, we get our share. So I think that's that's been the biggest thing. I don't know that I don't know what's happened with licensing. I don't think we're licensing them now. So. Um, I had a similar question actually, but uh, regarding taxis, um, you know, are are we doing something similar with the Ubers or a Lyft? Um, that was a later section. Uh, go ahead, Lauren. Well, and and on the taxi question, um, I was also looking at the definition of taxi cab, and I think the new micro transit might actually fall under that definition inadvertently because it says vehicles operating on a regularly scheduled route and time do not have to follow this, but if we're doing this new on-demand service, just I would think we do not want to have to, they're going to have their own whole process and things, so we don't want to call them taxi cabs necessarily, or we should just be clear that that is what we intend. Yeah, fair. Other comments? Uh, Donna. Well, and, and I would like to see us do a definition of Airbnb because there are some that really operate as a self-standing apartment <laughs> and are not really an, what the intention. So I think we have to work on that aspect. Uh, Jack. There is some information available. There is a report that was uh, that the state did, and uh, Kevin Casey has discussed that information with the housing task force, and so we can. Or, or might be worth just talking to Kevin to see, well, I think it's possible to even know exactly how many property owners were involved in short-term rentals in Montpelier during the course of a year. And so there's data. I, I like the idea of uh, licensure. I think that uh, there was a state, uh, there is a proposal to require registration or lic licensure at the state level that did not it was not adopted, but um, I definitely think it's worth looking at. I agree. Um, I have a whole bunch of questions, um, so uh, unless others have stuff they want to jump into. Um, okay, uh, as long as we're looking at it, uh, section 9201 about transient auctioneers. Um, part, I, I know this was a definition and it has a later section as well. I was a little bit baffled as to like, wh why do we have this section? This feels very archaic. Um, just like imagining like a traveling auctioneer. Um, I wonder if we need to keep it. And even if somebody did come through who was a traveling auctioneer, like what, do I care? Um, why should I care? Um, why, why should we be licensing that person? Or like, which is really like, why did that 
exist in the first place. I don't know. Probably scam artists, flim flam artists, those kind of things. Yeah, to make selling sure was somebody honorable and knew what they were doing. Yeah, selling snake oil. oil. Right. Yeah. Um, it feels. What's that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I, it seems to me like that's the kind of thing we could potentially take out. Um, I, um, yep, uh, Jack. I think auctioneers are licensed at the state level. So I think there's Great. a lot of things like this that we might compare what we have in this with what is already also already regulated at the state level to see, well, do we need to do anything that the state is already doing? Yep, fair. Um, that sounds good to me. Um, section 9202 uh, about use of the public streets. I was a little worried that um, we had somehow inadvertently uh, prohibited uh, uh, parklets or like pr uh, commercially related parklets um, because of 9202. Or the farmer's market. Or the farmer's market, yeah, fair. <laughs> Uh, so, just want to flag. I want to say, unless with permission. Yeah, yep. Some kind of um, modification there to make sure that it's like been checked by somebody. Um, also, I think it says something about or in public space, and that would also include, you know, the vending of anything in front of city hall. I think, and so again, you know, we, we don't want to prohibit that. And we do have a places for how those are dealt with in another place. Yep. Uh, okay, in section nine, uh, uh, 9502, this just seems I, I like just super particular. I, I mean, I know that we don't have any bowling alleys or, I mean, I, I guess we do have a shooting gallery. Um, I don't think we have any skating rinks, but even so, gambling at those places, it just seems highly particular. Um, I mean, are those places prone to gambling? Or like, if we were worried about gambling happening, would we pick these places? I, I don't know, it just seems kind of random. Um, well, you may be betting on the outcomes of games. Well, right, but if that's what we're worried about, right. like, then it shouldn't be happening at the ball field or, right. you know, any. Anyway, it just, I just wanted to flag that as like uh, confusing and perhaps overly specific. Let's allow gambling. <laughs> do we? I mean, do we have? Do we allow? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, isn't that already prohibited? <laughs> Is that not, not a thing? I don't know. Yeah, go ahead. I, I was in. Uh, listening to a trial in court many years ago, and the police officer was talking about how you could tell if a pool table had been used for gambling. What? Wow. And, and the answer is you could tell because uh, the felt would be nicked up because when they're using it for gambling, what that really means is that they're throwing dice on it, and so you can <laughs> see the marks from where, where dice had wow. fallen on it. Well, but, right, I mean, in that case, like, are we, if we're really worried about this, would we not include pool tables? I, I'm not advocating for that, I just... I think what yeah, you're getting at, and I don't want to cut you off on No, your, no, go for it. you're kind of on a roll, but yeah. I, I think the whole, part of the purpose of this whole exercise is to uh, go through and find what is in our ordinances that doesn't need to be in our ordinances, and... Uh, and there's, there are things like prohibition of gambling that is probably also already covered by state law. And if it's already covered by state law, I would just as soon not bother having it in our ordinances. There's like, and, and there's a whole lot of other things that, or a number of other things that I thought of that also hard to see why we need to be licensing. Bowling alleys, shoe shine operations, uh, movie theaters, um, I'm not sure what public sa health or safety or other benefit the people of Montpelier derive by having those licensed and regulated at the city level. Agreed. So I didn't come in and with a lot of more deletions, mm -hmm. but I think it's worth looking, considering doing that. 
Yeah. You're, you're in the pocket of the blacksmith lobby, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, the one blacksmith I know doesn't have his uh, his uh, smithy here at, in Mon the city of Montpelier. Oh. Good. Did you open the public hearing? I don't think I did. For this? Yeah. Thank you. I don't think I did. I'm going to officially open the public hearing on Chapter 9. Sorry. Thank you. You're so good. Um, there are a couple of what I think might be typos, so I'm going to just email somebody about that. Um, there were a couple places where we're listing the costs of, uh, uh, I think it was either the licenses or the fees, um, and wondered why those were still in there. I think we had taken out most of those, um, so just thinking about uh, consistency. Ooh, I was going to sneeze, but apparently not. Um, oh, we're, apparently we're banning rendering, like bone boiling. <laughs> that was, I mean, the only context I have for that is like the 1800s or like uh, things I've seen in movies. That What's that? I feel really strongly that it needs to stay. <laughs> that needs to stay? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, <laughs> maybe that was a huge problem at one point. I, I feel like we could take that out. I'm just going to put that out there. Um, and I think, <laughs> I think my only Bone other... Bone broth is a thing now, right? What's that? Bone broth is a thing. Bone now. broth is a thing. It's fine. Uh, yeah, I also had a comment about the, the shoe shining thing. I just wrote in capital letters the question, why, <laughs> in my notes. Why are we doing that? Uh, and that's, okay, and that is it for me. Thank you. Sorry. Lots of detail there. Other thoughts? Uh, Lauren. We'll be meeting without me bringing up something about toxic chemicals. Awesome. So. <laughs> um, under dry cleaners, it lists some, if you carry on the business of dry cleaning using gasoline, naphtha, benzene, or other combustible or explosive gases or fumes, you need to be licensed. Um, that's crazy that that was what was used, but now we still use things like perk and other toxic chemicals that do cause problems for communities when they contaminate groundwater and things. Um, so maybe we want to add in just a phrase about or other harmful chemicals. Like this seems to limit to explosives or combustibles. <laughs> maybe we could just add in the word toxic or something. I mean, we'd have to probably define that, but yeah. Yeah, I think we could come up with a phrase that um, I, if, if we're going to keep some licenses yeah. for stuff like this. Uh, well, I remember having this conversation, um, gosh, years ago when we, we were talking about what kinds of things might we want to keep licenses for, and dry cleaners definitely came up, and I think gas stations also came up, and in part it was because uh, even if, so if there was a problem, sure, maybe the state is keeping track of that, but, you know, from the city's perspective, would we have any city level repercussions or ways to hold people accountable um, as well. Um, and for, for those two things, I, I could imagine we, we might want those uh, uh, I know kinds the, of industries to be licensed. For the dry cleaners, it was more a, a record that they were in that location in yeah. terms of what might happen in the mm -hmm. future. But certainly, I'm wondering if for the use of the specific uh, chemicals, if there is a state regulation. I put a note yeah, to check on that. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. I don't know, but I would assume today's day and age there is. And the, the dry cleaners that we have here in Montpelier are just, you know, take them off site. We don't actually have dry cleaning in right. Montpelier. It's just pick up and drop off, so. Well, and it also but makes me wonder about, I mean, for the same purpose, I mean, there are other industries that use chemicals that end up in the soils. Right. Um, and that can be, that might be hard to um, uh, quant like enumerate, you know what I mean? Like it's this industry and it's that industry or whatever, and if we wanted to call those out specifically, but uh, I mean, I'm, I, I would be open to or interested in um, thinking through what, what that might look like. Um, you know, I think of like the, the, you know, Teflon industry in southern Vermont. And obviously, I mean, that might be a little reactionary, but trying to think through, like, okay, so what, 
uh, what type of industry was doing that and how would we have a, a record for ourselves if anything similar were to come up here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, I know a couple ways in, that I've seen in state laws dealing with this stuff. I mean, either some laws just have, you know, if you use more than pick a number, a thousand gallons of chemicals on a certain list um, that the state maintains, then you would need to get a license. So it could be that simple, or they have like standard industrial classifications um, that would cover a range of industries, and you could just put the codes, and they're kind of maintained. But if we're trying to get at the users of chemicals that might cause problems for the community, it might just be as simple as saying, you know, users and pick the level that feels appropriate that we feel like might have a kind of public well, that feels like concern down the road. That feels like the kind of thing that, um, as a policy discussion, I, I wouldn't necessarily expect staff to come up with that unless you feel like you could. Um, but uh, but that maybe that's a conversation that, uh, uh, you know, wh if there's interested counselors, that we can have that. Uh, like I, I mean, like I'm happy to have that conversation with you and see if we can figure out some proposed language. Unless um, I mean, I just hate to push that off to, to city staff. Um, unless you thought it, that was clear enough direction. I don't know, what, what, what do you think? Donna says yes. So you, you, can, you all can work that out? Okay, you'll work it out. <laughs> Fabulous. Yay. Excellent. Thank you. Cool. Further thoughts? Okay. All right, so I'm gonna close the public hearing. <laughs> Unless there's any public comment. Um, okay, on to event fees. Oh, thank you. Yep, yep, you're right. Let's schedule a second public hearing. Is there a second? Um, I move that we schedule a second public hearing on this ordinance. Um, probably not the next meeting because we're told it's a long meeting anyway, and doing some of this work could be a while. So I would say for the uh, first meeting 9th. in October. Is there a second? Second. Okay, further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? October 9th, yep. Uh, okay, thank you. Just, uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, you keep referring to the next meeting being long. Do we need to start earlier? I mean, how no, long no, is I mean, it? It's not, it's not just, crazy long. It's just because okay. we've had other stuff that's gotten pushed back. So, you know, I look at. Well, you I'm, didn't give us that nice printout. Well, it's. See, every time I print it out, you show up with one. So I didn't print it out to have for a reference I'm tonight. Oh. Wet oh, that's okay. Um, <laughs> no, it's my fault. Uh, speaking of which, could we actually um, get the board going again if it's yeah. doable? Yeah, save the paper. I prefer the board, but that's but just it, so we can have but, a... And the, it is also in your weekly memo every Friday. Yes. Right. The meeting no, I, schedule so people yes. can see yes. what's going Yeah. I like the board. Okay. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So, um, on to... Oh, right, the event fees. Um, so, you know, we, we've we kicked this around. As you recall, we had this discussion after uh, Senator Sanders' event about whether to charge or not and what under what circumstances. Um, and we, in that case, we, you know, they voluntarily paid, which was nice. Um, as staff, we discussed this, and I think obviously we're interested in where you're at. We, we realized that there's... Uh, I'll, there's a few distinctions. One is when the city itself, or through Montpelier Live, throws an event, like July 3rd or something, it, it seems kind of strange that we would pay ourselves for an event that we're doing, so those ought to be exempted. Um, we talked a little bit about political events like Senator Sanders, and I think you know presidential campaign kind of thing was clear. Um, we don't really get big state campaigns, rallies, I mean, maybe a gubernatorial, maybe. Um, but then where does something like the Women's March fall? Where does uh, some of these other 
things fall? Are those are those protests? Are they rallies? Are they political events? What what are they? Some of them cost a, a lot of money. So I think that's a consideration. I mean, our proposal was certainly for entertainment type. It well, and so and to that, at what point do charging the fees push someone into just doing the protest without getting the permits? It's better for us. It's better to be prepared and know it's coming and have adequate staff uh, than it is to get caught by surprise. So I think those are just things to think about. For, for entertainment events, our proposal was simply, if it's not city sponsored, we would charge the actual costs and I'll put in a, um, a provision where, um, and this is again up to you, where the group could come to the council seeking a waiver on that and make the case that there's, it's in the public interest to to have that um, to have that event, and you know, a variation of that might be costs above a certain dollar amount, so that you know we're not chasing them around for a couple hundred dollars every event. But if it's above five hundred dollars, then they've got to pay. So um, those were, you know, as far as we got, we really couldn't come up with a better system because it's we have so many different types of events, and so we were wondering. You know, again, we, we kind of seized this on the on the heels of the Senator Sanders events, the presidential campaign event, um, and wondering what the thinking still was about that. And then we'd be happy to work on more based on what you tell us. Thoughts, Glenn. Um. I kind of like the way it worked with Senator Sanders' campaign. Uh, and in a way, given that uh, we get lots of different sorts of organizations uh, and events, given that we, as I understand, we have not charged for any past events and the first one we asked for any money was the campaign rally. Um, and given, for example, that there, uh, some of the larger events uh, might also sometimes be the less organized ones, the, the ones that, you know, a, a small disorganized group calls it and then tons of people show up. And then if we're billing the small disorganized group, I don't know how well that would, would work. So I wonder if if it makes sense to say something like, um, I mean, I like your the, the idea in the memo about the threshold. I wonder if we said something like, uh, the city will cover up to threshold. Uh, past that, uh, because it does cost us money, uh, we will send a, a, an accounting <laughs> of, of what it cost and request uh, or, or you know, uh, suggest that that we be uh, reimbursed, but but not an invoice. I don't know. Does that make sense? So, that I, I would guess that we probably would get very little um, success with that. You know, so we have some events, like for example, the corporate cup is a good example. That's a big event, closes down a lot of streets, costs us a lot of money. I think it's four or five thousand dollars. It costs us, and this year they did make a contribution to it. It's also for you know a charitable event. So, but it is definitely an impact on the city, uh, not just our, our own direct cost, but residents. Dry, you know, it's, it has a huge impact. Um, you know, Burlington uses, and I think there's an example on your desk. They actually sign. You know, people sign contracts if they want to have public events. You know, how we have it, it's. We would picture if we were going to have a fee for people particularly if they're requesting a street closure and those kinds of things, then it becomes part of their fee. So you're going to have this, you need, you're going to need, you know, I think at Burlington's the threshold is anything that requires a, an officer to come in on overtime, that, other than what we would normally have on duty. So if we have to bring extra people in, then they sign a contract that they're going to pay for, um, for those additional costs, and that could be police, could be fire, could, you know, we, I mean, people don't think about, you know, public works ends up coming in to set up barricades and clean up trash, and, you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of costs that people don't always think about. For big events, we might add an extra EMT on that day or, or two. Um, I know Burlington told us that 
they even with nonprofits that have them, they, they you know they balk, but they they push them and they do it, and eventually they sign and they do pay because that's what it costs to run the event. It's just you know we just talked about fair labor, and I realize that, that in this case our the people are the, the workers are getting paid, but it's a cost of running an event that someone is asking that other people pay for, and the rest of us pay for, and. You know, may, so will there be times when someone marches and didn't get a permit? Yes, that's going to happen, and we just have you know we are the capital city. That's going to happen. But if someone's p planning event that's going to take over our streets or cause costs, maybe we ought to say to them, "Well, it's going to cost seven hundred and forty-nine dollars to the city for doing it." happens with like something like the do good festival bill it's like a massive event they said we had a bunch of city staff up there mm -hmm. is that something that's like worked out with national life or? um so we of course it's not on a public space um i don't know i know we did keep track of the costs and i can't remember if they paid it i i, I can find that i just don't know the answer to that but i know we did keep yes, yes they, they, they did the yeah do you remember what it was? So, so I think if we had a regulation that said it was actual cost, then I don't think it'd be an issue. Donna, well, I like the consistency of a regular cost, and, and that we're really upfront about it. And if ne necessary, we'll negotiate after the fact if it's more than than the organization can handle. But I would prefer to set a fee or a contract that infers some fee. And then perhaps they could request a waiver for that fee. Yeah. Um, Jack? I'm a little torn about this. For one thing, uh, obviously the city's incurring costs, and uh, it, it's an attractive idea to uh, recoup those costs. On the other hand, there's a lot of things, even though wh whether we agree or disagree with the political entity that's having a political event, I think it's a good thing that these events are happening in the, in the capital city. And by the same token, you know, it seems as though almost every month we have at least one request on the consent agenda for a street closing for some kind of event. And, and I think that's a great thing because it's, uh, it really contributes to the vitality of the city. And, uh, you know, I'm, I wouldn't want to do anything that discourages that or makes it, uh, makes it not happen. So and, and to be clear, not every event requires us to add people. You know, a street closure for a block party in a neighborhood, we don't put extra yeah. people on for that unless they tell us they're expecting you know a thousand people or something in which case it's a whole different event you know many you know the walks for causes you know we, we give permits for those but we don't there's no extra cost to deliver that service and even if someone's doing a quick march up the street and we help them up state street we usually don't put extra people on it's it's i think the idea is the ones where you have to to call people in and you know it's it's as you heard Captain Martell described a couple of meetings ago. It's, it's it's just hard enough to get the people, much less you know, then deal with the costs and all of that. So, I mean, it's it's really your decision. I, I think it comes up each year at budget time too when we we look at our costs and we say, well, this is one of those things that we're we're paying for, and it's perfectly appropriate for the city council to say these are things that we welcome in our community. We understand it's the cost of being the capital city, and and we'll bear those. But it's just it's. We should do that wide open, and we did make the decision to ask, um, at least in that presidential campaign, for the payment of our costs, and we received them voluntarily. Um, and and you asked that this come back, so we're this is this you know we're this is a sticky issue. That's why the staff was we thought we'd be able to come back. Oh, here's our recommendation, and it's it's hard. And so I don't know. Mm -hmm. well, Stephen, did you have a comment or question? Quick question on the the parking charge for the Sanders event. It was, I believe it was on a Saturday, so I wondered why there's a charge for parking. Two hundred and seventy-four dollars. I'd have to go. I don't know. Unless they did some pre, they may have done staging the day before. 
Okay. So they shut off a meter probably. Yeah, okay. they probably did Thank set you. up the day before, okay. I would imagine. The other question I had that, you know, given that this is the state capital, um, where a lot of people come to speak, um, whether there isn't, you know, even a sort of a constitutional question about, you know, the, the right of assembly, first of all, and secondly, you know, the right of free speech, you know, and whether, you know, you should be charging, mm -hmm. you know. So again, I don't think there's any, uh, so we did think about that, and, and I don't think we're not charging anyone to speak, and we're not preventing anyone from having their event, um, and certainly, you know, well, July 3rd is our, our event, but say it wasn't, um, you know, we incur a lot of costs on that day, the corporate cup. That's not, you know, that's an event that's tying up our streets and using our resources. And it's just saying, hey, the, the taxpayers of the city are paying for this, but people are coming from all over. And it's, it's a, you know, it's, a, it's not something we would normally pay for. And, um, you know, and I think when protests happen, they're, they're often, they don't get permits. And so we do end up bearing that cost. And I don't know that there would be any real way to build them after the fact. And we're talking about big things. Um, so, but, I, but you're right. I mean, that is the conundrum, right? We are, we are the host of that kind of conversation statewide. And what's our role in it? Just to um, respond to what you said about protests, and I wonder, you know, especially we're going to have a, a big protest of some sort on the 20th. I think most of it's going to be happening in, in Burlington, you know, re re concerning climate change. But um, I just wonder, you know, if you, you're going to have difficulty drawing a line between, you know, a really important protest like something, you know, concerning climate change versus other causes that might be, you know, um, I, I, more you know, I can't figure. speak for the city council. My professional opinion would be that we would not want to get into the business of deciding which which political issue was more important than, than which yeah. other one or which side we wanted to be on or which candidate we thought was more important than another. I think it's got to be what it is. And, uh, we, it, you know, if people have freedom of speech in assembly, they should be free to to articulate whatever concerns are on their mind. There could be an anti-climate change. Um, that would be absolutely unconstitutional right. to <laughs> impose uh, content-based uh, discrimination <laughs> on uh, who gets charged and who doesn't. Yeah, right. fair. Um, Lauren, anything further? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I definitely err towards the feeling of this is part of what makes our city vibrant. We're the city capital. It's a cost that we bear, but it's also brings people into the city who hopefully are using our great restaurants and shopping and doing other things while they're in town. And um, I, I think it does become hard to then, you know, for granting waivers, then we are kind of getting into the business of deciding who we think is a worthy public cause. Um, so it seems like that could become challenging to say who who would we or wouldn't we? Um, even the case with Senator Sanders, I was thinking about that after we made that decision, and I was imagining that some other presidential candidates would not have voluntarily paid, and so then are we penalizing good actors and bad actors are getting away with it for free? So I, I was kind of feeling like that wasn't a great, <laughs> great approach, potentially. So I kind of erred more towards the I mean, I think maybe keeping track and I keep thinking about it, but I'd rather keep it as part of the what we do as the city of Montpelier is where I'm leaning. Oh, Donna. Uh, Bill, could you remind us, I believe you gathered some cost of what we were paying and how much overtime? We have in the past. I don't know if we have it. Um, we... At we have point. tracked it, and we can get it for you. We, we right. have done it in the past, and for a while we were, um, in, in the weekly memo, we were, whenever there was an event, we, we would put well, it in what the actual Well, it was a couple councils cost. ago that were really right. concerned about all the overtime, and we got looking at all mm -hmm. these gatherings. So I'd rather not ask after the fact. I'd rather have it just plain and simple. This is one of the costs of doing this, and they spend money on other aspects, and we clean up after them. I mean, it's just... I think it's a burden that they need to share. The event that wants to come needs to share. It hardly covers the whole city yeah. cost, but I think it can help cover the cost. Go ahead, Ashley. Did you have something to add? 
I would I would just second what Donna said. I mean, you know, federal presidential candidates they have campaign funds, and I think it's perfectly reasonable for them to pay their fair share. If we have to bring in additional like public safety folk and BPW folk and emergency you know personnel, I for a specific event, I guess you know it, it's not a, a you know a cause issue it's more you know this is a, a candidate who's using our resources and basically requiring that resources be utilized for an event that size and that's just part i mean they they pay these fees all over the place so i i just and if you're running for for president while you know i appreciate that it shouldn't cost what it costs i mean the fact remains that if if the candidates themselves don't pay for it or you know, the organization that demands that we respond doesn't pay for it. That means that our residents are going to be seeing that and then we're going to be faced with, you know, a, another budget season where the question, you know, has been and will be once again at some point, you know, why are we going to have to cut? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Connor and then Stephen. Yeah. yeah, just the, the more I think about this, like, it seems almost impossible to define some of this stuff. So if it's a political event, is it a candidate? Is it a political action committee? Is it a political party that features candidates no, on I said, it? I said all events. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, you're, you're uniform, but like protest, what's that? The Women's March was a protest, right? It was a protest against like the president. So yeah, going, going into it in detail, I just, um, I, I, I don't know how to define it. I think I've changed my mind over the course of the discussion. I probably more with Lauren. Stephen. Uh, just one more question. I don't know whether the, the state itself, you know, charges anybody for the use of facilities, you know, on the, in the Capitol complex for these, these kinds of events. That might be worth looking at. I don't know if you've done that. That to me feels like a, a precedent. I, I end up, I think, leaning more towards uh, Ashley and Donna on this uh, in the, the sense that I'd, I'd rather be upfront with a cost and let them uh, ask for a waiver, uh, you know, if they, if they can't pay it, you know, especially if they're a nonprofit. Uh, you know, for something like the corporate cup, yes, there's cost incurred, but you know, it's for this cause, and would we consider waiving it and, and, and allowing that to happen? Um, uh, but and I could actually even picture on the form, you know, that people fill out to close the street, you know, is this event estimated to cost more um, than $500 in city staff or overtime? And well, most I, of the time the answer will be no, but right. sometimes it'll be yes. And I think if we had more events that were, I mean, like the example that's uh, given in this, um, you know, the document that we received is for the Discover Jazz um, Festival. You know, if we had more entertainment related events like Do Good Fest or whatever, it might be clearer that like, no, this is a, this is, you know, this is a company that's making a profit or this is, um, you know, this is not necessarily, um, uh, I mean, clearly political events are, are much more tied to issues of speech. Uh, but they're also sometimes fundraising. Sure, sure, yep. Um, so it's, anyway, I, it, if we were, somehow I feel like if we weren't talking about political issues, then it would somehow be clearer. Um, anyway, so, and I, I agree with Connor in that, you know, it's tough to differentiate or define what the content is. Um, so anyway, but that's, that's where I'm at and I'm happy to be you know, outvoted or whatever, so it's all good, but yeah. Um, I'm really glad we're having this conversation. It's kind of fun, I think. Uh, I am, I, I think the way I'm seeing it is we can choose what kind of host we want to be. We can't necessarily choose our guests. We're, we are the capital city and people come here and they will. Um, and honestly, to me, uh, the more I think about it, the more I think um, I think of it in kind of in terms of a potluck. That you know, when when someone comes to your house, uh, you ask them to bring enough to feed the party. But if they come and you know they don't have that food or a drink or whatever, it's not like you kick them out. You're still 
hosting. So to me, you may not invite them again. Though. You might not invite them again. <laughs> but but uh, we don't get to do the invitations. We don't get to do the invitations. The analogy doesn't hold all the way. Through. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you're. Uh, yeah. No, I agree. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, I think I, I guess I continue to feel that since so far. 100% of our requested donations to reimburse have been fulfilled, uh, that feels like a good model so far. And uh, one. <laughs> but, but I think we could, as the mayor said, uh, on the application for a street closure, say, if your event is going to bring more than X number of people, we think we're going to have to pay some overtime. In that case, we're going to be asking you to cover that. Um, and so they know that we're going to be asking them. Uh, but again, it's not a, a requirement, and it's not something that where, where we are picking uh, groups that, that we waive the requirement for or uh, charge, because I am a little uncomfortable with that, as, as Lauren pointed out. Um, I think it's better to, to uh, figure out what kind of host we want to be and then let the guests behave uh, as they might. I guess. Go ahead, Ashley. I just wanted to follow up if Anna said cool. Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to follow up. I guess I, I, if, the, if the council is seriously considering, like, the, the let's just ask and keep hoping they pay. I mean, my goodness, I hope President Trump didn't hear that because we know that he, like, has never paid any of his bills ever, you know. And so I guess, like, having a policy like that, like, puts all of us at a disadvantage when the degree of altruism that we are willing to assume in political candidates isn't followed through on. And then, the you know, the, the burden of that is borne by all of us. And I, I just, if the council, you know, if the council's leaning more towards like a let's just keep asking policy, I'm not super interested in spending any of my time on that because that's, that's not an, an effective, like that's, that's, to me, that's not an effective use of a, of a policy decision. But if that's to where everyone else is at, I totally respect that. And, and you know, I'm not interested in, in spending any time on that. Let's just, you know, keep, keep doing what we're doing until somebody says no and then we'll revisit it. That just doesn't seem. Effective. So I think, unless there's more comments, um, I think the question is, is there an appetite to develop a more formal policy? Um, uh, Jack. Just observing the conversation, I think that it's close enough. We don't know for sure if we had a vote what would happen tonight we yeah. had, would happen, yeah. but I think it's there's enough interest to make it worth, make make me think it's worthwhile to uh, go further, have a draft policy, have an actual hearing where we're inviting people to come and talk about it once we have a draft policy, and at least continue the discussion. So if that's the case, and, and again, I, I really don't, you know, I, I understand all the issues. I guess there's certain categories of events, so, I, so I'm just going to ask you questions. You can nod because these are, these are kind of the policy questions that are going to remind. So, so city-sponsored events would be exempt. exempt. Yes. Okay. There's one. So yep. We all agree. Yep. All right. Um, Entertainment-type events. Uh, to to the point that I guess Glenn was saying. What I would envision is we would actually when when we fill out our you know street closures or event permits. The, the police, fire, and public works have to sign off on these anyway. I think they would just put you know, we'll need extra officers, estimated cost X, and then the, the person can see in advance what the potential cost is going to be. It doesn't, you know, they, they're not caught with a bill after the fact, and then they can decide if they want to alter their event or that kind of thing. So uh, that's, a, that's an administrative matter, but might help. So, so enter, you know, street closures, entertainment, you know, those types of events, they would be, uh, consider those for, fee mm -hmm. okay can campaign events 
for a candidate for any office, I guess. I'm not going to say just president. Could be governor. Could be, I mean, who knows? Could be mayor. Could close down the streets and charge. Charger. That's right. That's, Closing uh, down so the streets. So campaign the whole city. events for <laughs> candidates. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And then. Uh, I don't know what the right word is. Events for causes, or marches, those kinds of things. That's one I, I have more pause about because they are so hard to, uh, they can be so spontaneous and we do want them to register with us. Sure, and um, some of them, are, right, and, and I'm not arguing, I'm just reminding them some like the Women's March were extremely well planned in advance with date and publicity and you know, there was no question it was going to cost us a bunch of money. But who would you bill? That's right. <laughs> well, <clears throat> the corporate cup has been mentioned a couple times, and it seems to me that's a very well sponsored, and businesses get a lot of publicity out of it. But the city doesn't get publicity out of what we've given, and so I feel it's fair to put our tin cup out there. <laughs> and say we th we feel that you should help us support. And they did provide some funds last year, yep. just again voluntarily, but I think, yep. I don't, I think it's, the event's because, still gonna go on. Because there, I mean, we have a lot of charitable groups, nonprofits, and some of them are really large. So I don't, don't say automatically a nonprofit can't afford yeah, it. I, I, my own feeling, this would be up to you, my own feeling would be the criteria for waiving um, a fee if you wanted to include a waiver option wouldn't necessarily be how big the organization is or whether they can afford it. It would be, is the is this event in the public interest? Um, you know, is, this, is there a public benefit? That's the criteria we use for upstairs as opposed to, you know, we're gonna throw this party and we're gonna, we're gonna close the street, we're gonna have this party, we're gonna make money from the sales of everything that happened and you have to put extra policemen on. I mean, the public might enjoy it, don't get me wrong, but it's not necessarily for the public interest, There's, you know. Whereas mm -hmm. I think, so I, because I, I, once we get down an affordability ro road, I think everyone's going to come in here and um, cry that they can't afford it. Coming back to your question, um, just to differentiate these two things, I, I, if it's a like a registered political candidate, then that mm -hmm. seems like one way to define it, and just a, a protest or a rally. Um, Maybe, maybe we leave that off for now. That one, that was, um, yeah. Thoughts about that? Yeah, Lauren? I just think that could be a little hard to sometimes define where the line is, or to somebody, is it kind of a private event, but it's like, oh, it's, I put it out on Front Porch Forum, so it's a public rally, or I don't know. It, maybe it's not as hard. I'm, I'm trying to think, I mean, one thing just to flag on that front, like I've been involved in a lot of events and rallies and often there's like 30 sponsoring organizations. So to Bill's point, like who do you bill and who is the bottom line? Like, and often it's pretty amorphous and things are changing and people are jumping in and throwing their name on stuff who might not realize there's any fiscal responsibility around it. So I, I do think for those kinds of events, it, it would be, I'm, I'm saying both sides of it. I think it's <laughs> like, uh, but I think it could be hard to figure out like who do we even, hold accountable, like somebody presumably might put the application in and then they alone are on the mm -hmm. hook for these expenses and they, they would have to figure that out. But I'm just I'm just going back to like, not wanting to discourage this kind of civic engagement. And I just fear that if you're like, well, I might as an organization be the one, am I willing to put my name in when it might be a huge expense because like 30 other groups sign on and all of a sudden it becomes this much bigger thing I didn't plan on and I have to hold the bag for that, like mm -hmm. as a small nonprofit or something, so. But I guess, like, if you're a political candidate running for, like, president, I feel like you should probably be able to hire someone who can at least read the rules. Mm. But, you know, and, and to me, like, I, I don't think that I have any interest in, like, pouring into the, you know, this is a, a nonprofit unless they ask for a, a waiver. But to me, like, I, I even think that, I'm not sure I haven't taken a look if there have been any revisions to the Vermont campaign finance laws, but I'm pretty sure that the way that our laws are written is that like if any organization or something or entity has to expend funds on something related to a political like 
candidate event or like an, an event put on by a PAC, like that has to get reported as an in-time contribution. So, uh, you know, whether whether or not, you know, anyone is complying with that reading of, of the state law, I mean, I, I still, I just, I, you know, I don't think there need to be like burdensome things to put together like a, a, a rally, for example, around a cause or something. But if you're talking about Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump or, you know, Elizabeth Warren, whomever it may be who's running for, you know, president, or, or frankly, even congressionalism, I mean, they have dollars so in, in their campaign funds to pay for these kinds of things. And, you know, like, rent is already out of control. And again, like, Yes, I want to be, you know, part of the political process, and I think we are as a political hotbed of Vermont, but I also want to be mindful that, you know, you can't, we can't expect residents to shoulder that entire burden, you know, because, you know, we want to support political candidates, you know, yes, that's great, we want to support political candidates, but we want to put food on our table, too. So, Ashley, I think, I don't know whether you, you weren't able to hear properly, but I thought, I think the council said for political candidate campaigns, they would impose the, the fees we, we we were debating was the extra rallies protests, not not directly associated with a specific p political candidate. And well, the, I think you have to be careful though because sometimes a pack can come in and this is perfectly permissible right. and in certain ways right. you gotcha. know where where it would in essence be an event that's on behalf of a particular candidate, but as long as they meet certain requirements, you know, the PAC can do it. And, and so I guess I'm just sort of saying, like, why would you want to give them a pass on that, you know, when, when they're utilizing other, you know, ways to circumvent the political process? Like, why aren't we just transparent in, in what our process is? And we ask the questions and have fire, you know, have chief of police and um, chief of fire weigh in on whether or not additional personnel is needed for the uh, events of any kind, you know, and, and then we go from there. Uh, Jack and then Connor. I suggest, because there are constitutional uh, implications here, I suggest we, A, consult with the city attorney on this point, and two, invite the uh, ACLU when we're having uh, our next discussion to come in and uh, comment either in advance or at the uh, meeting. Uh, and if I can add a C and a D on that, it's probably worth inviting somebody from the Secretary of State's office mm -hmm. uh, to Ashley's point on the campaign finance rules that have, uh, I think, recently been amended. Um, and it also might be worth like talking to like Manchester or Concord, New Hampshire, who sees a lot of this type of activity and see if they have any draft policies that we could maybe take a look at. Because honestly, if, I'm, if I was Bernie Sanders and I went to like skirt the rules on this and just get like a 501c3 or 4, like our revolution or something, say you put it on and invite me, you know, same differences. Yeah. Yeah. Right, exactly, and that's my answer. Mm. Uh, Lauren. And this is where, like, I just keep coming back to the squishiness, so. You know, so there's this climate rally in a couple weeks. So like David Zuckerman speaking, he's always running for something. Like what <laughs> is that a campaign <laughs> event for him? Like I don't think it's always as clear cut. Like there's like the rally that, that Bernie organized is one thing, but that was clearly, but then there's a lot of events that are like, I think to your point, Ashley, like, could it be a way of skirting it? So I think Donna's point of clarity and consistency, if we are gonna go down this road, um, even if I don't support it, I, I think consistency would be a really good <laughs> approach without trying to come up with squishy and Bill's categories. gonna draft a form that's gonna You're make gonna this all it, consistent. You're gonna nail it, Bill. Bill You know, that's why Burlington does it. Do you wanna, yeah. cover it all. If you're having an event that, you know, you're having a ton of people, a certain amount of people, then you're going to need, you know, extra security, making sure people are safe. You are employing off-duty officers. And so if you look at this agreement, you know, they say, you know, how much it would be per hour, but it also has other things in here, you know, um, holding us harmless for, or the 
police harmless for things that go on in that event. So um, I think they specifically went for all events to, to sort of not have to, to deal with this sort of thing. That's all I have to Thank say. Thank you. Uh, Glenn. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, if we're going to charge, then we should just charge everyone. Honestly, I don't, uh, that is everyone past a certain threshold of people maybe. Yeah, and anyone who applies for a street closure, I mean, you, you can't protest or protest, they're gonna happen, but if you are seeking out our streets to close, that, you know, that's a service. Um, but there is a difference, and I, you know, I don't mean to contradict you, but there is a, a, a like, a little side street for a neighborhood block party you know, yeah, I mean, someone has to put the barricades out, and usually what happens is DPW drops them off on Friday afternoon, picks them up on Monday morning, and then the people themselves put them out at the, you know, the time they've agreed to. And that doesn't really, that's not really any extra cost to us, and it's a, a nice thing. I think the issue is if, if there is an event that is going to cause a direct cost, then we put that on the form. You know, there could be a street closure on XYZ Street, and right, we just the, say the no downtown, cost involved. The, the right. Main. But if it's main state and it's going to be a closure and it's going to be public safety people and directing traffic and barricades and trash, then there's cost. And, yeah. and maybe it's just for police and not public works, you know, the thing that's going to cost the most. Or maybe we just come up with a flat public works fee and say, <laughs> if you have any, no, but I mean, just, yep. 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 you know, yep. then instead of having to worry about you know, it's, yeah, yeah. It's barricade package, it's 100 bucks or something. Mm -hmm. They charge interest. Yeah. yeah, I saw that. They charge interest. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, do we need a motion? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, I wasn't going to make a no motion, but I was at hoping when Bill comes back with his drafts, with Jamie's drafts, <laughs> <laughs> that you would also bring us the data on how much money we end up spending for the, in the past. Yeah. So I know at one point you, you told us, I just can't remember. We should dig that up for budget time. Yes. Uh, do we need a motion regarding this, or do you feel like you have clear enough direction at this point? I guess point? the only question is, do you have the attorney, I mean, do you care when you get it back? The weather's getting colder. <laughs> uh, I would love to be talking about this again sometime before the end of the year. Okay. Does that seem Fair reasonable? Enough. Yep. Maybe in conjunction with the budget. Yeah, yeah, yeah fair. Then you'll all be for it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Guys, we need more events in town so we can charge them. <laughs> no, okay. Uh, all right, thank you. Um, all right, and uh, the an appointment to the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. I know there was. Uh, Jack, you went. I was interested in being. Uh, appointed, but as I was concerned might happen, at least one of those days I have a hearing in court in Burlington, so I really can't volunteer to do it this, this time around. It's the first day that you actually have to vote oh. and attend the business meeting. The second day is just fun and workshops. <laughs> well, I, I actually could do that. Okay. I actually could do the... Uh, do. October 2nd or whatever that I Wednesday think, I think is. it's a Wednesday. Wednesday and Thursday. Thursday. And yeah. Wednesday is it's the afternoon right. session. That's the actual And meeting. I will say that this year is different, um, which I hadn't completely, no, uh, oh. you're, you're correct. I that's I when the business, no, that's when okay. the business meeting is. But, um, la and I'd forgotten this when we talked about it last time, but um, last year the, the, the league voted to do their policy discussions every other year so that the policies are now two-year policies so there is some business to take care of this year but it's not the full debate about oh. municipal policy so i i had pitched it as that and it's not so I just didn't want to disappoint anybody that <laughs> I, I'm, I'm less interested then Thank you. <laughs> 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 okay I, I, I've already signed up to go. If nobody else is going, then fine. It's really wonderful workshops. I'm sorry you all miss it, but maybe sometime. I wish I could go. Um, so, uh, Donna, you're interested? Or Lauren? No. no I was, I was Somebody nominate, nominate Donna. Me. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I nominate Donna. <laughs> Nobody else wants it. I'll second. Okay, further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank right. you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for doing it. Uh, okay, so we are uh, down to council reports. Uh, who would like to start? Uh, Donna, go ahead. I, I just want to remind you of a write-up, actually, in Bill and Jamie's newsletter. The Park of Palooza is one more Saturday. And if you haven't been there, it's a really fun time in Hubbard Park. The kids have a water slide, games, overnight camping, and September 21st, 3 to 9, Hubbard Park. This is the last chance for this year. Great. Thank you. Connor? Yeah, I just want to uh, welcome Rabble Rouser to town. Got the chance to stop by the other day. And I uh, was talking to Jacqueline, the owner of Nutty Steffs there. And uh, she did want to come in and introduce herself. Uh, in public comment tonight, but got very sick. But She's looking forward to doing it the next time, but I, I think it's a great uh, spot just sort of as an incubator for small businesses. Um, it brings a bit more life into our downtown, so very welcome to have them. That's it for me. Um, let's see. Uh, not a real report yet from the Homelessness Task Force because, as we noted earlier in the meeting, it has not yet met, but we are on our way. Um, and there are at least already side conversations uh, about this, of course, as there have been. I'm looking forward to that with uh, some trepidation, but looking forward. Um, I continue to visit another way down on Barry Street every month, and I think this month I will try to go I'm inviting myself there, so I should check <laughs> with them uh, <laughs> first. But I'm just going to say it anyway that uh, since the first homelessness task force meeting is on Monday the 23rd, typically I go on Monday afternoon once a month to another way. I'll just make it the 23rd. So if anyone wants to meet me at another way, Monday the 23rd from 2 to 3, I'll be there talking with those folks. and then. Homelessness Task Force later that afternoon, 4.30 here, I believe. Um, I've also been enjoying uh, representing the city on the Wood Gallery Board. There's a lot of good uh, activity going on there. I think the mayor got to cut a ribbon on an elevator recently. I sure did. Um, I missed that event, but I've been uh, watching the progress, and it's great there. There's a fantastic show in the contemporary gallery right now, uh, Tessa O'Brien and Galen Cheney, painting and collage, everyone should go see it. Um, and I'm working out the details, but uh, I will, I believe I will be teaching a drawing class at the Wood Gallery on Tuesday evenings for a month starting the second week of October. So, uh, that's going to be tons of fun for me uh, and possibly fun for my students. I don't know yet. We'll see. Uh, anyone who would be interested should contact the Wood. It's not up on the website yet, but I think it will be. Uh, I'm going to be away next week, so I'm not going to Baguito's next Thursday, but I will be there tomorrow morning as usual, 8.30 to 9.30. Thank you. Uh, Jack? I... Uh also, I think there's a lot of good stuff happening in Montpelier. I, uh, are you going to talk about Drive Electric? I was going to, but you can okay, do no, it, too. No, go ahead, because you're going to be able to be there, and I won't be able to be oh, there, Oh, fair enough. Well, I'll but, do that in my yeah. spiel, yeah. But uh, I, I was at the uh, Art Walk on Friday night. There's, uh, I stopped by the front, but uh, Councillor Hutchison wasn't there. But uh, I was working. Uh-huh. But... but <laughs> I also stopped by some of the other venues. There's, there's good work out there, and it's going to be up for like a couple of months, so uh, people should go out and see it. And it's one of those things that when I say, well, things are happening in Montpelier, this is, that's one of those things that's happening in Montpelier. And the other thing, I went to the uh, opening reception for Rabble Rouser, and I thought it, I was very impressed because I, w I wasn't there for very long, but I stopped in 
and there were probably 50 or 100 people in there, and I didn't know a single person. <laughs> and if we're bringing businesses to, to the city that uh, are attracting people that I've never met in my 36 years of living here, I think that's, uh, that, that's a great thing. So get out and, uh, and check the place out. Thanks. Go ahead, Lauren. Um, yeah, not much to report. I just want to note that the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee continues to meet. We met this morning, um, and I think in the next month or so, we will be coming forward with a proposal for um, kind of next steps for the committee. So I'll just leave you in suspense, but look forward to some uh, really good conversations about kind of the next phase for that committee. Um, and. I will let Anne talk about the drive electric, but I'm going to drive my electric car there. Yeah. It's great. Awesome. Everyone should get one. They're the best. <laughs> uh, Ashley, do you have anything you want to update us on? Um, no, not this week. Okie doke. Uh, so I have uh, three events I want to talk about. Um, so the first one, as people have mentioned, is the drive electric uh, uh, event that is this Saturday, the 14th. Uh, it's going to be at the State House Lawn. Um, speaking of street closures, we're, they're going to close down uh, Baldwin uh, Street and Gov I think that's Governor Aiken. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, anyway, well, they're going to have something like 30, more than 30 uh, electric vehicles there, 40 different types of uh, electric vehicles, um, multiple Teslas if you want to go check those out. Um, there will be a couple of dealers there uh, who can offer uh, test rides, um, just sort of around the around uh, you know the the block, so to speak. Uh, so you can feel how they drive. You can ask all your hard questions. Some of people who are actually living with uh, electric vehicles. Uh, besides that, there's going to be uh, other types of electric things there: uh, electric uh, lawnmowers and um, bicycles. Uh, you can test drive uh, electric bike there if you if you would like. There's also going to be music and food, uh, so it should be a great event. Uh, it starts at 11, um, goes till 2, so it'll uh, roughly overlap the farmers market as well. Uh, so I would highly encourage everybody to come out to that. It's going to be pretty interesting, I think. Um, electric music. And electric music. <laughs> well, amplified. Anyway, this is true. <laughs> Probably. Uh, <laughs> No, uh, no electric guitars, uh, as far as I know. I could be wrong, though. Um, <laughs> uh, so that's going to be a, a great event. Um, second thing is next week, a week from tonight, uh, there's uh, the 18th of September at 6.30. Uh, here in this room is going to be the transportation uh, meeting. Uh, we have uh, people from um, Agency of Transportation, uh, Sustainable Montpelier Coalition, uh, Green Mountain Transit, uh, uh, All Earth Rail. I'm sure I'm probably missing someone, but um, and the, and the um, on demand transit people. Uh, on demand transit people. We've re also reached out to MTIC, uh, see if they want to uh, present as well. Uh, the the idea is to have an update um, from all these different groups to give us a picture of uh, what the future of transportation. Um, might look like things that they're working on and it's an opportunity for us to sort of ask questions about, you know, the feasibility of things or um, just uh, whatever uh, probing questions we, we have about um, that, uh, the, the future of transportation uh, in Montpelier. So uh, that's uh, um, coming up. And actually, this is the, another thing I hadn't planned on saying, but um, there's going to be a, an additional transportation meeting on October 2nd. Uh, also in this room, but it's the Regional Planning Commission, it's the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission is um, planning on a, uh, a transportation themed evening um, in, in this space again, but having a, a regional um, perspective. And I think that will actually um, be very interesting uh, just because of the nature of transportation. Of course we should be uh, coordinating um, those plans with uh, people outside of Montpelier. Uh, so I just wanted to put in a plug for that. And then uh, f um, that I have on my calendar for 6 o'clock uh, here in this, in this room. Uh, yeah, October 2nd. That's a, another Wednesday. 
Uh, okay, and a fourth uh, event is uh, September 24th. It's a Tuesday, uh, day before our next council meeting. Uh, is the, the big reveal, so to speak, for the uh, Confluence Park design. So they've been taking in all this feedback for months about uh, what that space could or should look like, um, taking public comment, and uh, they've, uh, they've got uh, a product to, to show us. And so I had asked that they not be sort of revealing that at a council meeting. Um, and so we're giving it its own sort of night. Uh, so that's on the 24th. That's 7.30. Um, I think it's here, but I should double check the space. I'm pretty. The 24th, Tuesday the 24th. Seven. What's that? That's the regional transportation. Oh, I'm sorry. That's a bummer. Um, anyway, 7.30. Uh, I think it's, I'm sure it's going to be somewhere in this building. It's probably in this room. Um, so. Uh, in any case, I just wanted to put that on people's radars as well. Okay, that's it for me. Um, Clerk. Uh, Crystal. Um, I'll just remind people that Do you want to your mic? sewer bills are due on the 15th. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't have much except to say that we are very, very close on um, assistant manager and DBW just working out a few details. Hope to have an announcement soon. Great. Okie dokie. All right, so I think that is it. Uh, so without uh, objection, we'll consider the meeting adjourned. 917.